everybody. It's your boy, Jordan J. Adams, United Fight Alliance. Well, it's Carnivore Month here at For the Fighter and You. And to help celebrate, we're going to bring you three world-class MDs who all specialize in this nutritional protocol. And if even a third of the health benefits that are promised on this protocol come true and are accurate, this is a huge game changer for the entire planet. It is fascinating science, and as you'll see, some of the ailments that it appears to be working on successfully is mind-blowing. You're not going to want to miss any of these podcasts. So without further ado, let's get started. It's the Carnivore Nutritional Protocol on For the Fighter in You. Let's hit it. You're listening to For the Fighter in You. Dr. Anthony Chafee is a medical doctor and former professional rugby player who is giving a fresh lease on life to thousands of people around the world by professionally helping them shed weight and optimize health without any medication and helping to revitalize their lives and activity. An MD in medical science, Dr. Chafee has conducted years of thorough research and study on devising ways to treat ailments differently and naturally through dietary methods, physical exercise, and other lifestyle changes with scientifically supported methods. Particularly known for his approach to treating chronic diseases, many of which Dr. Chafee contends occur due to lifestyle and diet, Dr. Chafee hosts the podcast and check out this title, The Plant-Free MD with an associated Instagram page where he covers many of these topics and their supporting evidence, along with interviews of prominent figures in the international community. His YouTube channel, Anthony Chafee MD, reaches hundreds of patients and others suffering from different ailments, many of whom originated in their unhealthy dietary habits. Currently a neurosurgical resident in Perth, Australia, Dr. Chafee also works in a private functional medicine practice, treating obesity and chronic disease patients in Perth and elsewhere through video consultations. He's credited with successfully reversing multiple illnesses and reducing or even eliminating the need for medications for many hundreds of people. Welcome to the show, Dr. Chafee. And, you know, it's, we were talking a little bit before we went online and, uh, I say just I'm always so envious of people who have the capability to kind of like live five different lifetimes all at the same time. And when I look at your athletic background and your academic background and your professional background, I realize like this guy's a this guy's a multitasker. You were you were gifted, gifted by a great brain, the ability to do this and obviously great parents and uh, started early. I think I, I read somewhere in one of your bios that you started doing all this stuff like at 14 years old, which is just yeah. crazy. But anyway, they, thanks very much for doing the show. I know you're a busy doctor and I appreciate it. Well, no, thank you very much, Jordan. I really appreciate you having me on. So did I hit everything in, in, <laughs> in the uh, thing or is there something important to make sure we stress as we get into sort of what you focus on, which is the carnivore protocol? Um, did I hit everything or is there something that's important to make sure that the uh, listeners know about you before we go forward? No, I think, I know, I think that it, you did a great job. No, I think that that pretty much uh, covers everything. Yeah. just, you know, I, I've just noticed that, uh, you know, there's certain things that we do in medicine that don't actually get the job done. And, and that's because we're not really identifying the core cause. And once you look at things and analyze things a bit more and you recognize that, you know, that, that there's a different etiology, there's a different causative factor driving these disease processes well then obviously you know you you need to have a different approach so that's what i've been doing with with diet and nutrition uh because i've just noticed that there there are certain things that uh come about because we eat the wrong things you know humans are you know biologically we are carnivores that's the kind of animal that we are and and that's what all the best research and evidence and data shows us and i was like any other animal in the world in the world if you feed them something that they don't eat in the wild they get very sick and this is why there's signs at zoos that say, don't feed the animals. You can make them sick by giving them something they're not supposed to eat. So we're the same thing. We are exactly the same way. And when I started looking at medicine from that approach, you know, humans are animals, we're carnivores and we're carnivores that aren't living as carnivores. We're not eating as carnivores and everything in medicine just started slotting into place, you know, the chronic disease side of things, uh, you know, the prevalence and, 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 
you know, increase in uh, you know, chronic diseases such as heart disease, diabetes, obesity, even cancer, autoimmune disorders, uh, and, and so many other things. They've all come about with radical changes in our diet, supposedly trying to become more healthy, but in fact, we've become less healthy as a result of that. So that's something that I'm just, I'm just trying to undo that damage and, and just re-educate people so that they can sort of take back control of their lives and their health. We'll talk about the science of carnivore and low or no carb in a minute, but let's, um, let's first explore. You have a specialty in neurosurgery. It's, it's, um, it's a shame you pick such an easy topic and such an easy <laughs> academic uh, <laughs> path, but, uh, <laughs> Why, why did you decide to become a specialist in neurosurgery? I, I think it was just, you know, I have so many interests in all, all aspects of medicine. I, everything's interested me. And, um, but I've really liked surgery. I just always thought that, you know, being able to go inside someone and fix them physically with your hands is probably just the most incredible thing uh, that, that anyone could ever do. I just, I was just very, very uh, amazed by that. And I love that. And uh, I love being able to do that. It's also just a lot of fun. It's, you know, it's like when you spend your day just doing something really, really interesting and engaging, you're interested and engaged. It's very simple. Um, but neurosurgery specifically, you know, it, it, it's something that, that really, you know, was, was quite, um, you know, resounded with me quite, quite early on. Like my first few months of medical school, I scrubbed in on a couple neurosurgery cases and I was just blown away. You know, we had one lady, she got kicked in the face by a horse and sort of crushed in her forehead and her facial bones. And they had to sort of, you know, skin her ear to ear and, and pull her face down and like rebuild some of her sinuses from the front and the back. I had to like go in um, and uh, do a craniotomy, sort of take off a piece of the bone to, to get in and, and, and uh, fix some of these, these uh, broken, broken bones. And I was just looking at that. I was looking at the skull and I was just like, like, wow, that's, you know, right underneath there, that's her brain. That's who she is. That's as a person, that's, that's everything just right there in that organ. It's such a, it's such a crazy uh, thing to think about that. There's this, just this organ, this bag of meat and fat is everything. It is who you are. It's your entire humanity. And the next day I was like, okay, I want to go see more of this stuff. And then the next time they, they actually opened up the skull and you saw the brain there, it doesn't look anything like, like you think it does. It's like white with like a lot of like, like, like blue veins and things like that, purple thing, veins, and it pulses, you know, like pulses oh, out like that. What? It's super creepy. Yeah. What? And it's, and you're looking at it, you're like, Oh God, it's like <laughs> pulsing out. And, uh, and I was just looking at it and I was just, I, I, I think I was just sold at that point because, you know, I remember thinking everything that makes, this person who they are is physically encapsulated there and, and chemically bound and, and stored there, which is crazy. I mean, how, how does memory work? You know, it's just this, this chemical, you know, um, you know, these chemical reactions are just somehow sitting there and you can recall what you did 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Some people you know, obviously are older than that. That's crazy. And so I was just really fascinated by that. And I remember thinking, you know, there's a place in this person's brain that has the memory of how they felt about their dog on their seventh birthday. And you can touch it with your finger, you know? And I was like, that's nuts. Like, that's crazy to me. And I think that, you know, being able to, you know, fix somebody, help them with surgery is obviously an, an incredible thing to do. But, you know, when you give them back their brain and you're, you're, you're giving them back part of their humanity, you're not just giving them back their, their life, you know? So it's a, it's a major, major thing that you can, that you can do for someone. I was just really, really, blown away by that. And I just, I really wanted to know more. So I, I went into that. I think the sentence of the year for me in doing this show is one you just said a little bit earlier. And that sentence is they had to skin her from ear to ear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God, where are we going? What? what yeah. Oh my God. They had to skin her from ear to ear. Yeah. But that fascination, I can, I really feel how amazing that is just when you're saying that. And I saw a video once where the doctors would touch certain parts of the brain with whatever the tool was. And then that would, the memory would come to the person and just exactly what you said, the doctor would touch a part of the brain and then she'd say, Oh, I'm looking at my favorite, uh, you know, my favorite bicycle uh, underneath the tree. And it's just, yeah, it exists. It's like a physical, yeah. it lives in a physical place. We yeah. forget that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is amazing. And um you know, so I, I've just been absolutely fascinated by that, that, that organ. And, and you know, obviously in neurology, you, you study it probably more than neurosurgeons. Do you get into more detail with, with the medical side of things? But, you know, the surgery side of things, I just, I just absolutely 
Uh, I just love that side of things. And I really love the life and death sort of things like the traumas. You know, someone comes in the middle of the night, they're dying. You have to figure out what's going on and you have to know what to do and you have to know how to, how to fix it. And you have to do it right then or they're dead. And I, I really like that pressure. I really like being able to do that for people and, and being that, that guy ready to go in case that needs to happen. It, it's not fun, you know, not getting, you know, sleep most nights of the week and working 130 hours a week um, and then trying to do everything else on the side. But I, I really find those, those moments rewarding and being able to, to help people in those positions. It's interesting that you um, also have this profound interest in nutrition, in the nutritional space, specifically low or no carb, because they do seem to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they seem to be two different spaces where you're looking at, you know, emergency medicine, where it's physical. And like you say, it's hands on. And uh, that's where Western medicine shines, right? But this mm -hmm. other space that you're talking about is an area where, frankly, Western medicine does not shine. And that's in longevity and chronic degeneration and inflammation. Um, so how did you um, get develop this other interest, which is kind of in a different space, unless I'm missing something? Um, and, you know, how do you deal with with the two differences and, you know, the digressions or the confluence where they, where they converge? Maybe they converge in, in the brain space, right? In the Alzheimer's space. I don't know. You tell me. Well, they, they certainly do in, in that and other areas as well. But, you know, I'm, I've always been just interested in all of medicine and just, just health in general. Um, but, you know, yes, I mean, it's, it's certainly outside of just neurosurgery specifically, but, it, but it's applicable, you know, because, you know, a lot of the neurosurgery, we're dealing with cancers like brain, brain tumors and growths, you know, either, either malignant or benign. And this is absolutely fundamentally uh, a result of the way we eat. You know, I mean, um, I was speaking to Professor Thomas Seafried from Boston College, formerly of Yale, and he, you know, was showing quite clearly. You know, he teaches cancer biology. I took cancer biology 22 years ago, you know, and this guy teaches it. You know, and it, and he and you know, there's um, uh, you know Otto Warburg won the Nobel Prize in 1930 in medicine, showing how cancer works. It's a metabolic disease. This is a this is a disease of the mitochondria, and if you have healthy mitochondria, you cannot get cancer. It's not a genetic disease. The the genetic changes happen downstream of the metabolic changes of the uh, mitochondrial changes, and you damage your mitochondria by eating the wrong thing. You can damage it by other ways as well, but a major driving force is eating carbs. That's a big one. Uh, when we there's tons of studies showing that if you don't eat carbohydrates, if you're just in, in just on a ketogenic diet, not even a full carnivore diet, just a keto diet, you have your mitochondria work four times as well. And you have four times as many of them. Okay. So you get 16 fold increase in, uh, in the you know, efficacy of your mitochondria. Um, that's big. Also, you know, you have a lot of, you know, I talk about, you know, I'm the plant free MD because I took cancer biology 22 years ago and we learned how toxic plants were, how many carcinogens there were literally hundreds in every vegetable you've ever eaten um, of, of different kinds of, of carcinogens. They're quite abundant. There are 10,000 times more uh, carcinogens and, um, and toxic elements in, in vegetables than the pesticides we spray on them. That's, that's why pesticides are still legal is because the, the plants are more poisonous than the poisons we spray on them, okay? And so, you know, that's uh, that's why I stopped eating plants 22 years ago. And, uh, you know, talking to Thomas Seafried, you know, one of the things he pointed out, you know, I, I was mentioning that story to him, and he said, and you know, all those plant toxins, all those carcinogens from plants, they all affect the mitochondria. So this all comes back to diet. And and even more so, if you, so if you, you have healthy mitochondria, you cannot, get cancer. Okay. And so if you're on a carnivore diet, if you're not eating carbohydrates, if you're not uh, eating a bunch of plants with a bunch of toxins in them, you're going to have very healthy mitochondria. Right. And so you are not going to get cancer. Let's say you have cancer though. What happens now? Oh, just, you know, I guess horses out of the barn doesn't matter anymore. No, it actually matters even more now because Otto Warburg, you know, won the Nobel prize for showing that cancer cells use 400 times the amount of glucose that normal cells do, because that's the problem. If the mitochondria are damaged, now they can't go through aerobic respiration. They have to go through anaerobic respiration. They have to go through fermentation, right? Because they're, they're damaged, right? That's what makes them go wrong. That's what makes them kick off free radicals and reactive oxygen species. That's what causes the genetic changes. And that's what get, that's why, how you get this dig, dysregulation of cellular growth, 
which is what cancer is. It's dysregulated growth. You just, it just grows and grows and grows and can't be stopped and regulated by your body uh, like normal tissue. So it can't, you know, use energy normally. It can't get a lot of energy out of, uh, of your glucose. So it needs a lot more glucose and also has a higher metabolic rate. So it really needs a lot more glucose, right? Because you get far more ATP, which is the energy of your cell from aerobic uh, respiration, your mitochondria that rather than anaerobic, right? So you get like 36 ATP uh, for aerobic versus two ATP in anaerobic. Okay. This is when, you know, when you're athletes, everything like that, you have that, that lactic acid burn. That's because you've gone into, you've run out of oxygen. Now you're going down the anaerobic, uh, uh, respiratory rate. And now one of the byproducts is, is lactate and you start getting that, that burn. So that happens with cancer as well. So it's like, they're surrounded by lactate and things like that as well, but they need tons and tons and tons of, of glucose because they can't go through aerobic respiration. Okay. And so when you go on a keto diet or a carnivore diet, even better, you limit the amount of available blood sugar and glycogen available to those cancer cells. So now you're really, really starving that out from being able to grow and to uh, replicate and precipitate and, and uh, precipitate further growth and detriment to your body. So, and then your body runs on ketones, right? Which is very, very good for you. That's your brain's primary energy source. Don't let anyone tell you differently. Um, that's, that's what your brain always runs on. And it preferentially runs on ketones. As soon as it doesn't matter how much glucose you have, if you have a certain amount of ketones, your brain will just kick out all the glucose and only run on ketones. Okay. It's its primary energy. Cancer cells cannot run on ketones. So you have cancer. What's the best thing you can do? Go on a keto diet. You know, a lot of people will say fast. Well, what does fasting do? Fasting gets you into that metabolic state that you would be in if you were eating the proper food, right? If you were eating a carnivore diet, okay? And you will, and you will go into this energy, energy metabolic state where you will actually mobilize your energy much better. You'll actually be able to access your fat, fat stores. You're, you're going to an energy using uh, metabolism as opposed to an energy storing metabolism, which is what you will go in anytime you eat carbohydrates. So if you're ever trying to burn fat, real bad idea to ever eat carbohydrates. And it will also get you um, running on ketones. It will limit your blood sugar. And so it'll starve out that, uh, that cancer cell. And it'll do a whole bunch of other metabolic, you know, things that are very good metabolically to help your body fight that cancer as well. So it all comes back to diet. I think everything is a function of diet. I think there, there are very few things that don't rely on diet anymore. Um, you know, it used to be medicine sort of ran on sort of, sort of five main things, you know, trauma, you know, you know, pregnancy and childbirth, um, infectious disease, you know, genetic and, and congenital anomalies and, you know, malnutrition, you know, may, definitely one of them and, and poisoning. So maybe, you know, call it six. Um, and so now we have this, this seventh one, chronic disease, which takes up like 85% of the medical world. You know, it's all the, all the heart disease, diabetes, cancer, autoimmune, all these sorts of things. They're, they're, they're the only things we treat now. And they, they used to be so, so rare. And now if you, if you look at the data, if you look at the literature, if you look at the physiology and the biology, you'll come to the same conclusion I have, I believe, that that chronic disease thing should actually be back over here in that sixth category of poisoning. We are poisoning ourselves. We're eating things that are toxic and we're becoming, you know, we were getting, you know, the toxic results of it, you know? And so instead of trying to create some sort of de novo drug, from, you know, spend $2 billion coming up with some drug that sort of mitigates the, the effects and that as you die slowly over 40 years, why don't you just recognize this relationship? This is not a disease. You don't need to treat a disease. You need to stop being poisoned. You know, if you're being poisoned, the first thing you do is remove the offending agent. You remove the poison from your system and then you try to recover from that. And so that's what we sort of lost sight of. We think that, you know, here's a problem, here's a pill. That's sort of the model that we're in now in medicine. That's, that's completely wrong for the majority of things that we're treating now. You know, the majority of things we're treating now are again, malnutrition. You know, we're not getting enough of the vital nutrients that we need to support our bodies. And we're poisoning ourselves with these other false nutrients that, that we're bringing in because, you know, plants and vegetables may have nutrients and vitamins in them. That's great but they also come with a lot of toxic elements, which cause a lot of harm. And I, and I think that's very clear that it's those toxic elements and the malnutrition 
that are leading to you know the majority of the chronic diseases that we're that we're treating these days, and very simply uh, evidenced by the fact that I've had literally thousands of patients now and thousands, you know, thousands of people around the world now that have, you know, I've seen and have spoken to me and I've spoken to or directly helped who have reversed these diseases and these disease processes simply by, you know, eating, by not eating certain things. That's the only thing they're doing different, you know? And so you have people with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and people say though this is a chronic condition. You will never cure. This is uncurable. We can only modify it. We only have disease modifying agents called DMARDs. They're horribly toxic, you know, but you know, they keep these people functional. That's great. So it's disease modifying. They cannot cure it. Rheumatoid arthritis, same thing. They use these DMARDs. Well, we've actually have literature going back to the 1800s showing that people were curing all of these things by putting people on a pure red meat and water diet, right? They just go away. You know, and I have patients that have Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, Hashimoto's, you know, Graves disease, rheumatoid arthritis, all of these things within, you know, within weeks, they, they improve dramatically. Most of the Crohn's and ulcerative colitis patients, they, they almost have no symptoms within the month. And then within three months, I have yet to see someone with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis not have complete resolution on biopsy of their intestine in three months. I, I've yet to see that you know, by going on a full carnivore diet, even going on a keto diet, there's tons of, tons of studies showing that going on a keto diet, um, or elemental diet, that this is more efficacious than steroids for treating, you know, uh, acute flare-ups of Crohn's and also colitis. So, I mean, this is actually in the literature, you know, and I've, 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 I've sort of gone, gone head to head with some like gastroenterologists who were just like, oh, how can you say that this and the other? And I'm like, this is in the literature. And I was just like showing them study after study after study is like, how do you not know this? This isn't even my field. You know, like you should really know about this stuff. And so then they obviously, you know, you know, pull their heads out and then start paying attention. But it's, uh, I think it all comes back to diet. And I would really like to get things back to, you know, just those, those original sort of you know, five or six things in medicine. We're not dealing with, you know, all the chronic diseases. We're just back to dealing with traumas. We're dealing with, you know, pregnancy and childbirth, you know, infectious disease and, and congenital uh, and genetic issues. Those and poisonings, malnutrition, things like that. Those, that's real medicine. We've gone gone away from that. We've just dealt with a bunch of people that are being poisoned. It's like, you know, back in ancient Rome where people, you know, had had lead pipes and they all got low grade lead poisoning, you know? And they're like, oh yeah, I guess, you know, you're just, your hair is supposed to bleed. It's like, no, no, that's not normal. You know, and eventually someone figured out, they're like, no, no, that's, that's not normal. This is from, we're being poisoned. And so they figured that out and they got rid of the pipes. Well, now this, this is our lead pipes. You know, vegetables are our lead pipes. We're living in this. We're thinking we're healthy. We think this is normal. We think it's like, oh yeah, by the time you get 30, most people have diabetes. That's normal. It was never normal. It was never normal. We're talking with Dr. Anthony Chafee, a medical doctor in medical science. Dr. Chafee hosts the podcast, The Plant-Free MD. He's currently a neurosurgical resident in Perth, Australia. Let's get to some of our call-ins here. Uh, Heather from Columbus, Indiana, has a four-part question. She's going to take advantage of this uh, platform here. <laughs> I don't blame her. <clears throat> You're laying down the science here. I don't blame people. Let's get this science. She says, I wonder how long it takes to transition over. Do you want all the questions at once, or do you want me to go one at a time here? Either one. I don't know. All right. Uh, she wants to know how long it takes to transition over. She also wants to know how to convince others that not necessarily eliminating daily is just fine. How much water is the target? And then what seems to turn on people's metabolism? Um, <clears throat> so transitioning, uh, you know, by, just biochemically, you know, you should go into your, your alternate, your so-called fasting metabolic state in 24 hours, 24 hours without carbohydrates, uh, you know, sugar, alcohol, anything like that. And you should be in that metabolic state and you should be mobilizing fat from your fat stores and keep running on ketones and things like that. Now your body will become more efficient at that. And you'll be more able to utilize those ketones efficiently to varying degrees, but that, that really shouldn't take more than a few days, few weeks, really on the outside. Um, and then, but generally, you know, people, people just do you know, quite well right away. And so, you know, like I, I never, I felt fantastic right away when I was doing that and biochemically, you should be back in that, 
uh, metabolic state within 24 hours after not eating carbohydrates. Um, so, you know, what, and some people call that a fasting state. I think that's, I think that's wrong. I think that's uh, our so-called fasting state is actually our, our primary metabolic state. That's, that's the metabolic state of, you know, nearly all animals in the wild. That's where all of our heavy machinery comes to bear. I think the only reason we call that a fasting state is because by the time we are able to look at our biochemistry at a molecular level, uh, we were, you know, everyone was eating carbohydrates. And so they said, oh, when you eat, you know, your metabolism looks like this. And when you don't eat, you know, it looks like this other thing, but they fail to recognize that if you eat anything except carbohydrates, it also looks like you're in a fasting state. So it's really a carbohydrate versus non-carbohydrate driven state, because you only go into that so-called fed state only if you eat carbohydrates, you eat anything else and you're in this so-called fasting state. And obviously you're not fasting, you're eating a whole bunch of protein and fat. So you're not fasting, obviously. Um, so that's, I think that's a bit of a, of a misnomer. Um, as far as, uh, what, what was the second question? So is how, said, to um, how do you convince others that it's not bad or not dangerous to not eliminate every day? Eliminate. Oh, eliminate is in. Yeah, ha bathroom. have a yeah, pass. Yeah, yeah pass right. a stool, I guess. So, I mean, just very simply, you know, we, we eliminate waste because it's waste. We don't need it. We don't want it. Our body's getting rid of it. So if you're not getting rid of a whole bunch of stuff, it's because you're not eating a whole bunch of stuff and you need to get rid of, you know, I mean, that, that's just a further example of why you shouldn't eat a bunch of plants and fiber because you cannot utilize it. You cannot break it down. You can't absorb it. You can't get anything for it. You have to get rid of it, you know? And so it's, um, you know, it, it's, 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 you know, you're only getting rid of things that your body doesn't want and doesn't, can't utilize, right? So when you're eating meat, you're going to absorb 98% of the meat that you eat, as long as you're not eating fiber and plants, because fiber will just cause a physical barrier and get in the way of digestion and absorption, right? So you can't get the enzymes to the meat to break it down. And then that can't get those breakdown products to the lumen of your intestine to then get absorbed. So it, it ends up getting not absorbed properly. We also have a lot of things, uh, digestion interrupters, like different things like, you know, protease inhibitors uh, in wheat and in soy and in other plants. And this blocks our enzymes that come from our pancreas that break down proteins into amino acids. And then so we can't break them down properly. We can't absorb them properly. And so even though you're eating this very bioavailable protein source, if you eat it with plants, you'll actually stop your body from breaking it down and absorbing it properly. So if you're only eating meat on its own and you're not eating all this poison, then you'll absorb about 98% of it. So only about 2% will sort of go through that you can't break down, you can't uh, utilize. And, you know, and that's what's going to come out. And so obviously you're gonna have much less, but basically the polar opposite is true of plants. You basically can't utilize about 98% of the plant because that's all fiber and you can't break it down, you can't use it. So it all has to go out. And so, it's, um, you're just going to, you know, you're just going to go to the bathroom way less often because you're going to have way less stuff to get rid of. And that's actually a good thing. You know, it's not like, so what's well, being stored in there. And it's just, it's not like a secret room that, you know, this meat just goes into and just locks away and just, Oh, we're not going to let this go. And people say, it's like, Oh, you have 50 pounds of meat by the time you're 30. And it's like, are you, are you stupid? Like, I mean, this is a tube. It goes one way, you know? Like, this is like, you know, I, I mean, I saw, I saw that for what it was when I was a kid, you know, I remember seeing it like, I, I swear to God, Beverly Hills cop. They said that it was like the, the Judd Reinhold guy was just like, did you know that by the time you're 30, you have 10 pounds of undigested meat rotting in your gut like that. And I was just like, I remember seeing it as a kid. And I was just like, how? You know, like you, you shit it out, you know, like it's just, it's not going to work, you know, and like, you know, even, even like, you know, think about it this way, you know, people say that you're supposed to eat fiber because you can't break it down. And this gives your body something to peristalsis and move down the track. So this right. can allow you. To I've heard that. I've heard that. So if you're not breaking down meat, if you can't digest it, you can't break it down. Wouldn't that be doing the same thing? Right. And so wouldn't that be good for the same reason? You know, no, I've, I've never seen you, you. You don't defecate lumps of meat. You know, I don't anyway. And, you know, when you're talking to, you know, people that have stomas, you know, they have like the, you know, they have like their in, intestine that has some sort of surgery or damage. They have a bag that comes out on their stomach. Um, you know, and that's where the waste goes into. 
you know, you, you talk to them, you know, they eat just meat, almost nothing comes out. You know, they eat plants, the full plant comes out, you know, it's just completely undigested, you know, plants and, and uh, vegetables and fiber and corn. I mean, everyone knows corn, you know, and like, and then you do, do like colonoscopies and things like that. The people that are eating a bunch of vegetables and things like that, they have dirty, dirty, dirty colons, you know, and they have a whole bunch of like food material and plant fibers, everything like that in there, you know, someone who's eating meat, none of that. It's nothing. There's nothing there, you know? And so, no, it's, it's not a problem to not eliminate every day because you don't have things to eliminate. Are there any vitamins, minerals, nutrients whatsoever that are missing that you would need to supplement if you go strict carnivore? And again, we're talking about meat, you know, animal meat, animal protein only, is there anything missing that you would need to supplement on the carnivore protocol? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, short answer is no, there, there's nothing that, you know, that, that exists in the plant, plant and fungus kingdoms that, that you need that you cannot get from meat, but there are things in meat that you have to get that you cannot get from plants. Okay. So, um, that's why, that's why we have to eat meat, you know, you know vegans and vegetarians, like they have to supplement heavily if they're not eating any animal products, because there's just things that they are missing. You cannot get complete nutrition, no matter what you do, just eating plants and, um, on, on a vegan diet, like you, you have to take supplements. You have to take, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, processed, you know, uh, product you know, that generally are, are derived from animals at some fashion down the track. But, um, but no, there, there's nothing that you, that you uh, are missing on a, on a carnivore diet simply because, you know, this is our biologically adapted diet. This is what we evolved on. This is what we're designed to eat. And so, and as such, it has everything that we need. Think about it. What are we doing when we're trying, when we're eating? We're trying to build and maintain a body that's made out of meat. So what's by definition going to have everything we need to maintain and build meat? Meat, right? You know, this is like, I read a study back in the day. They were talking about how like it, our, our ancestors must have eaten a lot of honey. There's no, no evidence for this. The reason they said this was because, well, we had these big brains that are very, very, you know, ener high energy demand brains and they are, you know, a large percentage of our energy goes to just running our brain. It's much higher percentage than any other animal. And so, right, well, so it takes a lot of energy. So we need something that's very energy dense. And so obviously we must've eaten honey because honey is just so, so cal calorically dense. And, um, and then they were talking about all these different sorts of nutrients that you'd need. You need to get, you know, this plant and this thing and this thing, and all this, you know, this from here and this from here and fish from here and that from there and all these sorts of things just to get all the nutrients to build this big brain of ours. And I remember thinking, I was like, what is, I can think of right now, one food source that by definition has every nutrient you need for your brain. Brains. Like, I mean, this, this, this is, I mean, come on, you know, like, and, and in fact, you go back to the fossil record, our ancestors before we had like, you know, you know worked stone tools that used for with a cutting edge, there's actually evidence that going back millions of years before that first, first worked stone tool was about 3.3 million years ago with Australopithecus, probably Australopithecus. And that's like, you know, they hit this stone in just a way and it knocked this thing off and had this big, sharp, razor sharp edge. And they could use that to kill and dismember uh, animals, you know, because we don't have teeth and claws. We can't cut these things up. And that's actually why we had to develop tools. And that's why we have houses and lions don't, they didn't need to develop tools. We had to develop tools. I'm very happy that we did because now we have brains that go with those tools. And, and um, you know, but before that, for millions of years before that, our ancestors were using big pound stones to crack open the skulls of carrion animals and get at the brains. And that was, that was a major source of our nutrition when our brain was growing and we were starting to become evolving differently than other, than other primates. And, um, and so, you know, we were absolutely going after brains and saying, oh, honey, it's very nutrient or calorically dense. It's like, you know, density means, you know, calories per gram, right? But, you know, it's just a carb and carbs are carbs. And that's, there's no more calorically dense than any other, dense than any other carb or protein is fairly similar. Fat is very calorically dense. It's nine um, uh, kilocalories per gram, you know, whereas carbohydrates are four kilocalories per gram. So that's actually actual density. That's actually much, much more there. So, um, 
sort of long-winded answer, but like, you know, we, we really are trying to build and maintain meat. And so the animals that have been able to, you know, subjugate plant matter to then build and maintain meat, they've done the hard work for us. And now we just eat them and we are able to sort of use their body parts for our body parts. And that's, that's, you know, we're heterotrophs. That's, that's all animals are heterotrophs. We have, something else has to die for us to live. That's the sad reality of life. And, um, you know, but it's, um, it's, it's something that we, it becomes a lot more simple, you know, just, just understanding that biological fact can make things a lot more simple. So people will say about, you know, <clears throat> there are different sort of, you know, RDAs or recommended daily allowances of different nutrients. And like, you know, there's not enough vitamin C in meat, there's not enough manganese and all these sorts of things, but you have to realize that the RDAs, uh, were, were calculated at a time when everyone was eating a mixed diet. You know, when you're, depending on what you eat, you need a different amount, a different constellation of nutrients and, and vitamins and minerals. And so, um, you know, when you're eating carbohydrates, <clears throat> you need a daily amount of, um, of uh, vitamin C measured in milligrams. Whereas when you don't eat carbohydrates, just carbohydrates, you need vitamin C measured in nanograms. Okay. So wild difference you know, and how much, uh, how much more you need if you're eating carbohydrates. And there's a number of reasons for that, but this is true of, of a lot of other nutrients as well, a lot of other vitamins and minerals. And so while it, you know, it may appear on the surface that we're missing out on things or we're not getting, getting enough of X, Y, or Z, you know, that's, that's only because we're, we are, have measured this in a, uh, we're, we're comparing apples to oranges. You know, we're, we're looking at what's rec what's, what's required for people that are eating the wrong thing, you know? And so if you're not eating the wrong thing, you don't get that. I mean, think of, think of, <clears throat> think of like the Inuits, you know, and the Eskimos, right? So they're, they're eating just blubber and meat and there's no plants to eat up in the North pole anyway, right? So they don't have access to it anyway. How are they surviving? If there's, if you're, if you're deficient in any nutrient, they're all dead. You know, you cannot live generationally with nutrient deficiencies, you'll, you'll die out. And you'll think of the ice ages, <clears throat> you know, people I've, I've heard different vegan uh, proponents say that when the ice ages were coming down, well, that's not, you know, and I say that, well, you know, during the ice ages, we're not, we're not eating plants. We're not getting fruit. We're not getting honey. We're not getting any of these sorts of things. So, you know, people were just eating meat and, and they said, oh no, no. What happened was you know, people would, when I say ice shelves came down, people went, moved more towards the equator. And in fact, it's the opposite. You know, if you if you look at at the the fossil record, when the ice age, when the ice shelves were coming down around two million years ago, people were moving up. They were going north. They were going into the ice. You know, so you know, actually, you know, we were we were definitely surviving, um, you know, without any of these plants and and uh, and fruit and whatever. So, <clears throat> and there's tons of, of populations today living like that. So we know biochemically, we know nutritionally that you need a different constellation of nutrients based on what you're eating, but we also see just from direct observation, we have, we have, you know, entire civilizations that only eat meat and do so generationally and don't get the diseases and problems of, of, you know, modern, of the modern world. Is you told us, um, about, uh, you know, the adaptation, you're going to lose the weight you should lose, and then you can build muscle upon that. So you're cleaning up the marbling, you're cleaning up the toxins, cleaning out all the bad fluids, and then rebuilding nice, clean, lean muscle. Very, very exciting to me. We know about the keto flu. You get a lot of people feel like junk when they're trying to adapt over from being a glucose burner to a fat burner. Is there a carnivore flu? And if there is a carnivore flu, how long should it last? And are there any protocols you could use to speed it up or kind of help deal with the nausea or the potential junky feeling if there is a carnivore flu? Yeah, there, <clears throat> well, there, there shouldn't be any, any actual harm to your body. You shouldn't actually feel like you're getting the flu just by converting over uh, biochemically to, to different biochemical states. You know I mean? Think of it, think of every person going through Lent or Ramadan, you know, they, they, they do fasting cyclical fasting. And so they're going, they're switching back and forth between these metabolic states daily, you know, and, and, and they do this for a while, you know, they're not all feeling like they have the flu. They're not feeling all, you know, crummy and gross. So there's going to be a, re there's going to be a couple of reasons for that. Other than that, I think, um, 
a major one is going to be withdrawals. You know, people are getting off specifically carbohydrates and sugar, as we spoke about earlier, sugar is a drug and it, it will cause a withdrawal, you know, and then coffee as well. Coffee causes a withdrawal. You generally get like bad headaches and things like that. And, um, so I think that that's, that's a major component of that is that you're, you're withdrawing from these substances and you know, artificial sweeteners as well. I, I, I know people that they found that it was harder for them to get off like stevia and, and uh, art, other artificial sweeteners and the sugar alcohols and things like that. And, and um, you know, energy drinks, it was harder for them to get off that than it was to get off actual sugar. And they had horrible, horrible withdrawals. It's like, dude, just, you, you know, just, you just go, it's just a few more days and then they're gone, you know? And, but like any, any drug, any withdrawal, it ends, it has, it has a shelf life, you know, it, it will, it will run out. And so you just have to just get to the other side of it. Um, I think another thing with, with keto that, that, um, you know, people that are doing keto don't necessarily realize this is something that, that I've sort of, you know, you know, with my background in cancer biology, recognizing that plants were toxic and stopping eating them, you know, 20 some years ago, you know, I, I sort of brought that to the conversation five, six years ago when I spoke with Dr. Sean Baker on his original podcast, the Human Performance Outliers podcast. I was one of his early guests and, you know, I sort of saw what he was doing and I was just like, I, I had an aha moment. I was like, dude, this guy's, this guy's dead on. And like, I knew about the plants and I knew about the cholesterol being good for you. I knew about sugar being toxic for you and all these sorts of things. And so I wanted to talk to him and sort of just compare notes. And I was just talking about, about plant toxicities and, you know, just basic botany and, um, and how toxic they were. And so one of the things that, that people do in keto, especially, you know, in, in you, know, re, you know, previous years is that they're all told, like you say, like, well, you're going to be missing nutrients. Like all your nutrients come from plants. That's where all the nutrition is. That, that, that's something that just is a flat out lie. It's just been, you know, pushed out for the last 40 years. And, um, you know, and it is wrong. It's, it's based on nothing. It's based on the fact that they said that, you know, there, there's, um, it, they're more nutrient dense in comparison to, to calories, right? So because they don't have much calories, because I have like no nutrition, so they have more nutrients per calorie. Whoop do you do? You know, you still have no calories, you know, you still have no nutrients. And so, but that's where that comes from. They sort of say, oh, all these nutrients, there's so many nutrients. So that, that's coming from people trying to sell you these things. That's, that's exactly what that's coming from. Um, so the people doing keto, they're like, oh, okay, well, I don't want to eat carbs. That's, that's what's bad for me. And so I'll get, I want to go into ketosis. So I'll eat a lot of fat and I don't want to eat a lot of protein because I don't want to kick myself out of ketosis somehow. I mean, it's not, it doesn't do that in the way that they think, but that's what they think. And, and then they think, but I need to get all my nutrients from vegetables. That's where I'm going to get all my actual nutrition from. They think they're like gaming the system somehow. And they're just sort of trying to manipulate these things in the, in these sorts of ways to give them some sort of, you know, uh, leg up. It, it doesn't, what, what they're doing is they're going towards a carnivore diet, which is great. They're eating, they're eating meat and they're eating fat. Awesome. And they're getting rid of some toxic elements like carbs and sugar. Perfect. They're getting into metabolism. They're supposed to be in any way. And, um, and then that's, that's where all the, the, the benefits go away because now they're thinking, oh, I have to eat a ton of vegetables. That's where I get all my nutrition from. And that couldn't be further from the truth. A, they're not bioavailable nutrients. They're not very nutrient dense at all. And they come with a ton of toxicity. So you're going on keto. And the first thing you do is like, you know, increase your, your uh, vegetable intake by like a factor of eight. And then all of a sudden you feel like, oh my God, I just don't feel good. I have this keto flu. I think you're just actually poisoning yourself is what you're doing. You're, you're detoxing and withdrawing off of, you know, sugar and carbs and, you know, maybe artificial sweeteners. And then you're actually just pumping in way more plant toxins than you've ever had in your life. And it makes you feel like crap because that is what poison does. It makes you feel bad. And I can tell you now that like, you know, I haven't eaten any of these things in years now that if some of that stuff slips into my system, like I will feel it like a little bit, like I don't even use seasons and seasonings or spices or anything like that. I've been at the sharp end of this for years now. And so like, even like small amount, I can, I can tell the difference between different meats. You know, I feel, I can tell the difference between like grass fed beef and, and, and grain fed beef and as well as in, you know, pork, bacon, chicken, eggs versus, you know, a steak or something like that. I feel way better on the steak and way, way better on the, on the grass fed steak. And, um, but, you know, just for everyone listening, grain fed is perfectly fine. You're not, you're not, you're not, um, 
you know, you're not missing out really. It's, it's, it's better than everything else on earth. So if you can't get grass fed, <laughs> yeah, right. Like it's second um, best. So can you live with yeah. second best out of all of the food on, on earth? Right. That, that's it. Right. It's just like, yeah. you know, it's like gold and silver at the Olympics, right. You know, like silver right. lost to gold. Sure. But right. silver also beat everyone else on earth, you know? Right. And so, you know, it's, um, that's it's, really good. Uh, I'm glad you said that doctor, fantastic. because for a lot of people, they do not have access to grass fed, yeah. uh, grass finished, certainly. Um, yeah. and you know, they're in food deserts, uh, but even in food deserts, you can get meat and that's kind of the wild thing. You can go to a really decimated, uh, poverty stricken city and you can find meat. So that's, uh, Oh, this popped into my head. What about canned meat? Is canned meat okay? Or is that a, cause I, yeah, that's well, a great traveler. You could put fish, you know, they have the all kinds of cool fish that in the cans, with the pop cans. Yeah. Is that uh, okay? Yeah, dep dep depending on what they put them on in with. So if you're, if you're putting in with sunflower oil, no, you know, you don't want any sort of seed oils, plant oils, anything like that. You know, yes, they are fat, but they're not really like the good kinds of fats. And they're also very unstable when they come out of the plant and they break down into uh, reactive oxygen species. So, you know, everyone talks about, uh, you know, antioxidants, you want antioxidants, you know, you're talking about um, antioxidants that are in plants and things like that. Well, plants actually have a lot more oxidants. Okay. So they have antioxidants, but they have way more oxidants as well. And, and a lot of those come from the oils. And, and when you separate the oil out from the plant, especially the seed, and, and again, seed oils, the seed is a plant's baby. It's going to have a lot of toxins. You're going to, you're going to press out a lot of those toxins in with the seed oils as well. And this, this, just the seed oil itself breaks down into, you know, bad actors, uh, along the way. And especially when you cook with these guys that rapidly accelerates, the degradation of, of um, the degradation process into these into these free radicals. You know, anyone who's taken sort of high school chemistry uh, should know that every every ten degrees Celsius that you increase a reaction, you double the reaction rate. And so, if you get something up to cooking temperature, you're increasing the reaction rate into the into these breakdown molecules into the free radical um, uh, oxidation uh, state molecules by millions of times, millions and millions, sometimes into the billions if you're, if you're cooking at a high enough heat. So definitely don't want to do that if it's so, so packed in brine or salt water or its own juices or whatever, then that's perfectly fine. You don't want it in any sort of you know, plant or seed oil, even olive oil, you really, really don't want to, don't want to do anything that's- Oh, um, good question. I was going to ask you is, is, are there any transitional foods? If you're going to kind of do a slow conversion, a slow adaptation, are there any conversion foods that come to mind for me it would be like an olive oil or olives or avocados? Um, Cause they're oils and good fats. How, where do you, where do you stand on, on transitional foods or supplemental foods that are, you know, good and good fats? Yeah, I think I think there's I think there's definitely a hierarchy, and if you're if you're trying to eliminate out things, then then you can certainly do it in a stepwise progression. I mean, we've already eliminated most plants on Earth, right? Most plants on Earth are inedible; they'll just kill you. You know, you get lost in the woods, you run out of food, you can't just eat any random plant, right? Most of them will cause you serious harm or kill you. So this is this is a property of plants, and that everyone should just be aware of. Um, then you sort of go down the list, right? So. Um, Carbohydrates and sugar, number one, just get rid of anything containing sugar or carbohydrates. So that includes fruit. And, you know, people say, well, fruit, you know, is going to be less toxic than other things. Well, not necessarily. Most fruit will still kill you. Okay. You know, most fruit on earth, most berries on earth will kill you. That plant may want something to eat it. doesn't necessarily want you to eat it. You know, there's a lot of toxic, um, a lot of uh, tropical plants that are deadly poisonous. There's a cassowary bird. eats like over like 150 different types of tropical fruits, all of which will kill you dead. You know, it's because they want the cassowary bird to eat that plant it want, or, or to eat that fruit because the cassowary bird germinates the seed in their gut. They defecate it out. And now that plant can live. If the cassowary bird isn't doing that, that seed does not become a tree. Okay. So it really has a vested interest in nothing else eating that fruit. It wants something to eat it. It just doesn't want anything except the cassowary bird to eat it. So it's very specific. Um, now fructose containing fruit is more safe in the sense that we don't really know if things that contain fructose that are acutely poisonous 
for humans. And that's why fructose tastes so sweet. We recognize that as safe. It's a safe, quick hit of energy that will get us where we need to go so that we can then get our normal food and our normal, get our kill or whatever, and we can survive anyway. And that gives us a survival advantage, you know, when we're sort of eating that. So in that sense, if you're starving and you're out in the woods, sure, eat sweet fruit, fine, do that. But, you know, when you have a grocery store and you have access, you know, that's a different story. Sugar will cause long-term harm. It will also cause short-term harm. It will disrupt your metabolism. It will change you into a, a fat you know, storage state instead of a fat burning state. And it will sort of screw you up in a lot of other ways, but it will give you a hit of energy. It will replenish your liver glycogen and also replenish your gly- liver fat and a lot of other sort of things. But fatty liver it's, disease. Um, hmm. yeah, exactly. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is from fructose. That is what that is, you know? And so that should not be called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That should be called fructose fatty liver disease. And so it's, um, it's going to cause harm, right? But if you're starving in the woods, go for it. Does but that detox as- out when you go strict carnivore, can you reverse some of these damages to the body mm. by going strict carnivore? hundred percent. Yeah. They just, they just go away. I mean, even, even just removing fructose, there, there are studies actually showing causation actually met the Bradford Hill criteria for causation, um, that Dr. Robert Lustig of UCSF did showing that if you just remove fructose from your diet and actually stay isocaloric, so you actually, you have, you're still eating the same amount of calories, if not more calories, but it's just different calories. You're not eating fructose, you're eating other carbs, you're eating bagels instead of donuts, right? That you will reverse fatty liver disease. You will reverse metabolic disease. So, you know, this, this, that's why it met the, the criteria for showing causation between fructose and metabolic disease and, and, uh, and fatty liver disease, because you can, you can reverse it. It can go back and forth. Right. And I've seen it, I've seen it, uh, in practice. Absolutely have. It's, uh, it's very, very, very straightforward. And it's, uh, it's not subtle. It's, it's kind of crazy, you know, because the, the differences that people get in their health are so dramatic. And they're so quick. It's just, it's crazy. Like how different your body, your, your bloods, your hormones, your, uh, your, your, uh, vitamins, minerals, and, uh, and other factors that you would look at just change dramatically. Any sort of disease process that someone has, depending on the disease process, obviously there are, there are things, uh, that exist that, that are cause a problem besides just the food we eat. It's just the food we eat causes such a big problem. That seems to be a lot of what we deal with. Um, and so, but when you remove that, you remove that toxicity, you know, that, that toxin, then the toxicity goes away. It just goes away on its own. And we just see that. And so, yeah, I, I absolutely see in practice people reversing out of these things. And you know, see people reversing, you know, reducing their, you know, coronary artery calcium score by going on a high fat, high cholesterol carnivore diet, you know, and, uh, there's a guy, he's a, he's a very uh, famous, uh, cardiologist, um, and a guy I've, I've come to know and, uh, um, uh, friend, uh, Dr. Asim Mahotra, who I've had on my show, uh, he wrote a book called a statin free life. And he shows it, that, that, uh, atherosclerosis, that heart disease is just a, an inflammatory disease It's an inflammatory disease process, sort of like how I described earlier. And, um, metabolic, and, just like cancer is metabolic. metabolic. That, that's it. Exactly. It's a metabolic disease and, and the same drivers, uh, from, for, for heart disease as diabetes, as cancer, as, as all these other things. And so, you know, he shows that like, if you just reduce the inflammation in your body and, you know, the same things that would sort of get rid of, uh, you know, diabetes, basically just cut out carbs and sugar and alcohol and, sh- and smoking, and you'll get rid of, you'll lower your coronary artery calcium score as well, your CAC score. And so that, that's really what's going on here. And so, and, and carnivore is the ultimate elimination diet because you're eliminating everything you don't need. You're only keeping the things that you have to have. Man, we put a vehicle the size of a Cadillac Escalade on Mars and we operate it remotely. We mm-hmm. can do that. And yet we, and, and all this science is sitting right there and they can't put this together and, and like, and disseminate it to us. Like it's, there's a part of me that's getting so pissed off. Like, <laughs> like that this, this is still being propagated. It's, it's, mm. it's really, uh, Meredith from well, Foxborough, not- Massachusetts writes in, she wants to know if there are any techniques or nutrition tips that help with her late night carb and sugar cravings. Oh boy. There's not too many people who can relate to that one, Meredith. 
<laughs> what do you say, Doc? Um, Anything that will help speed up the transition, kind of the, it's a, almost mm -hmm. a follow up to my other question, speeding up that conversion over to fat burning so that we start losing the cravings for sugar and carbs. Yeah. I mean, all, all these addictions, you know, they're going to, you're going to have, have, uh, you know, cravings for them as you will. But, you know, one of the things you have to ask yourself is, is, um, you know, sometimes these cravings can just be hunger because your hunger signals will change dramatically going on a carnivore diet, or even just a ketogenic diet, because when you are eating carbohydrates that derails your, your hormonal, uh, uh, hunger signals, right? So blood sugar goes up, that's bad. Insulin goes up to try to protect that. Uh, that causes a lot of problems. One of the things that it, that it does is just, you, you know, stop down your blood sugar, your blood sugar goes down. Now you feel like crap because insulin stays up for 24 hours. And now you can't mobilize all of your fat stores, right? Because insulin forces energy into cells. It doesn't allow it to come out of cells. And so now you can't actually mobilize energy. You can't maintain your blood sugar. You have no ketones to speak of. And so you feel like crap. And so you say, oh, I have to eat carbs. I have to eat carbs to burn carbs. You keep eating carbs. You keep having these up and down swings of blood sugar and insulin all day. Um, and then it causes you just to keep eating and keep feeding that beast but it does something more insidious, which is it uh, insulin blocks a hormone called leptin. Leptin is you know, secreted from our stomach and, and uh, intestine from like stretch receptors. If it's like, especially, this is why people said you should eat fiber uh, back in the eighties because this will help you lose weight because it stretches out, you know, release leptin, make you think that you're full. And then your body, you can actually like not eat but you feel like you're full. You're tricking your body into thinking it's full. It's like you're not. You're not tricking shit. I'm sorry. You're just not that smart. You're not tricking. You know these massively complex biochemical processes and this this machinery that has been developed and fine tuned over millions and millions and millions of years. Like you're just not that clever. I'm sorry. And so, you know, you're not fooling anyone. But leptin is mostly secreted from your fat cells. Okay. And so that goes to your brain to tell your brain how much energy you have. It's like a running gas gauge. Right. And so when you eat sugar or carbs, insulin goes up, insulin blocks leptin. Now your brain can't see it's leptin. So it thinks that you're, that you're actually emaciated and you're starving and your blood sugar is dropping. So you get a panic signal that, that, you know, you know, because you have, you know, your brain sees that you have you know, thinks that you have zero energy reserves and your blood sugar is dropping. So it sends out a panic signal that says, if you don't eat now, you will die. And so this is why we panic eat three, four times a day. I have to eat. I have to eat. I have to eat. I have to eat. And so we overeat. We eat way more than we're supposed to. And this is why people say, oh, you have to count calories. Well, you shouldn't have to count calories. What animal counts calories? How many koalas do you see with a calculator figuring out their macros? I mean, it's nonsense. You know, nature is natural. It just happens on its own. You should be able to just eat. And then something in your body tells you that's enough. Okay. That's how every single animal on earth works, including humans when you're eating properly. And so when you're just eating meat, this is a very different thing. When you stop eating carbohydrates, it's a very different and lectins. There's other, other plant toxins that screw with this. Like lectins come from, you know, beans and other plants. Uh, they can also bind to insulin receptors, uh, more tightly than insulin. So actually you can still get these responses and, and so you can still overeat. And so even people go from keto to carnivore actually lose even more weight and, and, and become more like, you know, slim, you know, bad weight sort of thing. Um, so you will have to relearn your hunger signal. So quite a lot of the time people will actually under eat on a carnivore diet. And so all of a sudden they're getting cravings because their brain is saying, Hey, stupid, get, eat food you know? And so all of a sudden you're like, Oh, I just have to eat carbs. I have to eat carbs because you're not, you're not listening to your body's other signals. So you have to relearn your body's hunger signals. And so if you're getting carb cravings, think to yourself, does this mean I'm hungry? Try eating. If it tastes good, that means you are, because that's that positive feedback that your body's going to give you. It says these nutrients, we want them. I'm, they're going to taste good to you. Right. So you keep eating until they stop tasting good. They will stop tasting good. Why is that same steak cooked at the same time? It should taste exactly the same if it was just a one-to-one -one chemical reaction. And yet it's not, it doesn't because your brain is giving you positive feedback at the beginning because it wants those nutrients. Now it's had enough of the nutrients that, Hey, we're done now. Now it's giving you less positive feedback. So it doesn't taste as good. And it'll start to give you negative feedback. And people will say when they start like a carnivore diet and they're just, they're not used to portion control. They're like, I hate this diet. I, I, I just hate eating this stuff. I hate eating meat. And I asked them, I was like, okay, do you, do you hate it at all times? Like when you first start the meal, does it taste bad then? And they go like, well, no, actually it tastes really good at first. 
but I get like halfway through and I, it takes me two hours. I have to force feed myself. It's like, well, that's your brain telling you to stop. You know, you eat as much as you want to eat, but you clearly did not want to eat the second half of that meal, right? So you have to listen to that. And so if you're doing that, you're eating to actual satiation. And by that, I mean, you eat until meat does not taste good anymore. Then you will not, you will minimize those cravings. And, you know, Dr. Uh, Sean Baker actually says, you know, people say, how much should I eat? He said, eat, eat as much as you need to, to, you know, you know, stop having cravings. So if you have cravings, think about that as, does this mean I'm hungry? You know, try eating meat. If it tastes good, you're hungry, keep eating, you know, and, and go like that. Eventually you'll, you'll stop having the carb cravings and you'll start getting used to, um, how much you actually need to eat, how much your body actually wants. And then you'll be able to, you know, just, just go with that. And uh, anytime you get carb cravings, anytime you go like, Oh my God, I really want that donut, you know, try eating meat or eggs and just see if you're hungry. You probably are. And you just keep eating until that goes away. You know, it's funny. The first time I tried this, um, I legitimately felt hunger and I had the revelation mm. that I hadn't had that feeling in perhaps 40 years. It was a new feeling. It was a different feeling. It was a real deep hunger, like where my stomach was growling. And I'm like, oh my God, this is what it feels like to be hungry. I've been doing carbs every 27 minutes because I have to keep doing it just to keep my blood sugar at a certain level. So every 27 minutes, I'm getting up from my desk and going to the fridge to do some other spike. And this is the first time I felt hungry. And I tried the, the steak and it tasted perhaps the best taste I've had in 50 years. I went Rah! like a, Rah! I couldn't eat it fast <laughs> enough. And sure as enough, you said, and when it was over, it was over. I put the fork down. I'm like, okay, I'm done. What you said was really powerful in that there are specialists who deal in longevity and, and um, you know, bodies that the, the inflammatory issues and all that, you know, diabetes, heart disease, and, even dental caries and of course all of the uh diseases of dementia and they don't know about this or they're not doing anything about it and this isn't even your specialty and 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 you're you're dealing with this you know like you're having to deal with this um i don't know just it's it's crazy to me that this is not being this information is not being shared especially in the you know yeah. by our medical professionals well, I mean, the problem is it's been, it's been overshadowed or it's been, it's been locked away and tried to be in sort of discredited. This is all in the medical literature, all of this, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't done any, you know, de novo research. I haven't done any sort of, you know, clinical trial or anything like this to prove any of any of these theories. This is all demonstrable by the current literature that is available today and has been available. Most of this stuff for, you know, decades, decades and decades and decades. Um, you know, I've just taken this and look at this and said, look, this is, this, this looks like this. Um, this is the way there are studies showing that, you know, you, you can get these results doing these things and I've just put them into practice. And I found, yes, this absolutely works exactly the way, uh, we thought we, they would. Um, the, the problem really came from, you know, the 1977 USDA declaration that cholesterol caused heart disease and saturated fat increased cholesterol. So this changed everything. Before that, everyone knew that meat was very good for you. In fact, before that, it was just like, okay, you need to try to get enough of these things. You need to try to get enough meat. You need to try to get enough, uh, you know, uh, vitamins, minerals, proteins, fats, all these things. Uh, everyone knew this. This was, this was, this was well-established, um, you know, and in books and literature and in the, in the, um, you know, in the medical literature as well. This is very, very well-documented and tons of studies showing all of these sorts of things. Um, that turned everything on its head because now, you know, it's the official source. It's the government saying this is bad. And, and for some damn reason, people decided to trust that, just listen to that and go, oh, well, it must be, must be, you know, that must be uh, the answer because, you know, teacher said so. I was like, well, teacher can be wrong. You know, it's called appealing to authority. It's a logical fallacy. Just because someone's in a, a position of authority does not mean they're right. You know, you know, Hitler was an authority. Does that mean he's right? We should let's just listen to him, do everything he said? And probably not. You know, so, you know, we sh you should take everything with a grain of salt. And just because you like someone or you trust someone does not mean that that person is right. You may give them the benefit of the doubt, but, you know, you know, trust but verify, as the saying goes. Um, this, this, this basically threw out 
a hundred years plus of, of the medical literature. And, you know, even just in gastroenterology, there was a book written by a gastroenterologist in 1975 um, by Dr. Vogelin, uh, basically already called the Stone Age diet, arguing that, look, humans are carnivores. And, and he basically made the case that if, you know, that no one, that his profession as a gastroenterologist would not need to exist if you didn't eat plants. You know, as you said, all of these things just go away if you stop eating plants. They just go away, you know? And so what, what does that mean? That means they're being caused by the plants, right? And so this is all thrown away. I mean, as, as recently as 1975, there's a book written by a mainstream, uh, you know, medical doctor arguing this exact same thing. And then bang, 1977, throw it out. Because, you know, maybe that's true. You shouldn't eat but you can't eat meat and it causes heart disease. Well, got to get away from that. And, and just everyone just, just forgot about everything they had ever known about medicine and health. And they just, they just went down this rabbit hole of as long as it doesn't have fat, it's good for you, you know? And so that, that was, I mean, I was a kid in the 80s. I remember this. It was as long as it didn't have fat, it was good for you. There was, there was candy aisles with signs, with exclamation points saying fat-free candy. And like, it's candy, you know? It's like, who cares if it's fat-free? I remember when Entenmann's came out, you know, it was like this, this frosting I remember covered that. coffee cake. Yeah. Yes. And, and so that was the thing. It said, it said, you know, it's like fat free. I remember my mom saw it. She's like, oh my God, fat free. She, had, she put two in the shopping cart. I was like four. And I looked at it. I'm like, I was like, okay, those may not have fat, but there's no way that they are good for you. You know, oh I, I'm, you know, I mean, I remember it's so obvious, you know, but in but the that's 90s, it. I remember going to Publix and buying all of these like pastries and these different things because it was bragging that it was yeah. vegetarian and it was fat free and it was and that yeah. in reality the leave if you're all right it's a sugar treat but leave at least leave the fat in to slow down the sugar you know like the <laughs> you know like if that's yeah. if that's the best you can do at least leave the fat in um mm. well, you know what, because what comes to mind good for um, i want to play devil's advocate a little bit because mm. you know, people who this is mind-blowing information to and flies in the face of everything we've been taught for the last 30 or 40 years. Um, I know for me, here's a couple of mine um, that I had to get, or I'm still trying to get over. One is when that LDL number goes up, from what I've studied, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, as long as the HDL is high and the triglycerides are low, don't even worry about that LDL number because it's, 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 it means nothing as long as the other elements are in place. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's correct. And, and, and it's not that the LDL itself is, is the problem. Uh, it's that, that lower HDL and higher triglycerides is indicative that there is a larger sort of in, inflammatory disease process that's going on that can then damage your LDL cholesterol. And again, the LDL cholesterol doesn't actually really matter after that anyway. It, just, it sort of never matters. Um, but you know, having the high HDL and the low triglycerides indicates that your, that your LDL uh, you know, um, transport molecules aren't being damaged and aren't being turned into these sort of small, dense lipoproteins. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of LDL, first of all. There's tons of different kinds. Um, and some of them are very, very good for you. Some of them are more associated with disease. And the reason that they're associated with disease is not because they are a driver of disease, but because they're being damaged by the same process that's damaging the rest of your body. So when you eat a bunch glycation. of carbohydrates, glycation, yeah, exactly. So okay. when, when you have high blood sugar, that actually physically damages your body. So the glucose molecules physically fuse to other molecules and damage them or destroy them. And this is bad. Fructose does this more as it has a higher uh, glycosylation rate than glucose does. Um, fructose, and fructose is really toxic too, because it actually is shown by the biochemistry department at UCSF uh, that fructose gets broken down into your liver into the same byproducts as alcohol. So you get the same damage from fructose as you do alcohol. You get fatty liver disease, cirrhosis, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, even implicated in uh, Alzheimer's as well. So not a good guy. One of the things they do is this, this you know, you can think of it as sort of, sort of oxidative stress is sort of damaging, oxidizing uh, the different molecules in your body. This is what kills diabetics is just having, you know, years and years and years of high blood sugar. And this just breaks down the body around it. And, uh, and, and just having correspondingly high insulin actually shuts down a lot of biochemical processes as well. And it screws you up in a lot, in a number of other ways. 
And, um, but just looking at uh, that side of things, just the, the high blood sugar side of things, you're, you're, you're glycating uh, and glycosylating a lot of uh, molecules in your body. Uh, one of those things is your LDL cholesterol and you damage uh, a receptor on there called the ApoB100 receptor protein. And there's only one of those. Okay. Once that's damaged, it's gone. And that's what your liver uses to recognize, to pull that in and, and utilize it normally. If it, if it can't do that, then it's just sort of, you know, uh, not being utilized properly and your body has to sort of get rid of it some other way. And the only thing that can really recognize these things are your, your macrophages and these scavenger receptors on your macrophages. And they just sort of have an, a near unlimited capacity to suck up um, anything really and sort of suck these things up, but they don't really have anything to do with them. And so they just sort of turn into these big, large foam cells, we call them foam cells. And then if you have damage to your uh, the, the walls and the lining of your, uh, arteries, then these things do what, what, uh, macrophages do. They go and they try to fix damage, you know, as some people say, it's like, oh, well, the, the cholesterol is going in there because cholesterol is trying to go and fix it. Well, no, it's not, it's not really that. It's that the macrophages are trying to go and fix it because that's what macrophages do. And now they get in there and they're just stuffed with LDL cholesterol and they get stuck, you know, for some reason. And, and that's what sort of grows these plaques. So that's what's going on there. So it's not that, you just have way too much cholesterol on your body's just like, oh my God, you just got to get it out of there. It's that you have damaged cholesterol because you've been eating a bunch of carbohydrates and sugar or drinking alcohol and you've been damaging your cholesterol and now your body can't utilize it normally. And the only thing that can pick it up are these macrophages. That's what's going on. And so if you have high LDL cholesterol and low triglycerides, it's indicative that you are not going down that pathway and you are not damaging your LDL cholesterol. And therefore you're not having a bunch of damaged uh, LDL cholesterol and SDLDLs that are being sucked up by these macrophages and, and being utilized in this process. But no matter what, it's still not the LDL causing it. They are not that fault here. Okay, that's like blaming, you know, a, a bank robbers getting away because they had hostages. It's like, oh, we should kill the hostages next time. That, that'll do it. You know, great idea. We'll just go in there, gas the hostages, kill them all, and then we can get those damn bank robbers. You know, no, I mean, that, I mean, that's kind of what statins are. You know, you're trying to, you're, you're really trying to, you're killing the hostages uh, when you use statins because they're like, oh, well, you know, get this LDL cholesterol and oh, it's being used, utilized in these plaques. So let's, let's kill all the cholesterol. It's like, no, they, they actually are there for a reason. You're, that's, that's something you want to protect and, and take care of. It's There's something else. There's another malignant process going on that you actually need to address and you're completely ignoring. So, you know, you treat the raw, you, you don't treat the root cause. You're not going to get the right cure, right? So if you, if you have two different diseases and you get, and you misdiagnose them, you're going to use the wrong treatment and you're not going to get the right result. You're going to have the side effects of the treatment and you're not going to get the results. You're not going to fix the problem. That's what we're doing now with heart disease and many other diseases, unfortunately. Wow. It's amazing how linked it all seems to be with high blood sugar, all of the diseases, cancer, mm. diabetes, all the diseases of dementia. Um, it just seems to it, heart disease, all the big killers. These are like, you know, the, all the bigs, cancer, heart disease uh, between those two. I don't even know what the numbers are. Probably half of all deaths would be cancer and heart disease. And, and it seems that this addresses that. And for that, mm. for something that big, to, to exist and for us not to know about it is 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 mind bending that that we don't the average person when they think of eating steak only and I'm the average person when I think of eating steak only the first thing I think about of course is heart disease and it's you know my LDL is going to go up and I'm going to get plaque and where am I going to get my where am I going to get my phytonutrients where am I going to get my fiber where am I going to get my antioxidants all the things I've been told about plants and fruits it's still, it's almost like there's multiple elements to doing this because there's a psychological element to eating animal fat. Like you're, I, I still, even knowing what I know, all right, I'm, I'm eating steak now, but I still <laughs> kind of cut around the fat a little bit. It's just like, yeah. eh, I kind of hedge my bet because the thought <laughs> of eating animal fat is so yeah. I, for 40 years, I avoided it like the plague, you know, and as a proud vegetarian living in California, you know, for 16 years and feeling pretty good, probably because I was in my 30s. And you know, that's probably why I still was OK, because my body was still able to fend off all of the insults I was I was giving it. But there's still a psychological element, which is a whole different thing to address. And I know that. But when someone looks at you and they see you're like you're still 
you look great and like how you keep your lean body mass without and you've lost your you're like your bmi your body mass index looks fantastic one of my all right this has been one of my challenges and again it's coming back to kind of the psychology of this all but is the times that keto is, is impossible for me maybe it's the lack of protein whatever but that was like disaster pants from day one <laughs> the keto i can't I, my body just doesn't recognize the fat as an energy source and it never seemed to adapt but the the carnivore seems to be more manageable for me for those reasons i'm not getting the diarrhea and also psychologically for me like in the gym and stuff i know i've got the protein which i didn't have with the keto because the keto is a low low protein but i'm trying still trying to get that fat as an energy source do you have any recommendations in that regard in terms of the kind of the hard gainers out there who don't want to lose weight because that's mm -hmm. you know one of the things we shout from the rooftops with carnivores you're going to lose weight you're going to lose weight which is great for 80 percent of the people but the 20 percent who are hard gainer ectomorphs is that what's what's the key to keeping our our lean body mass or even growing our lean body mass in this protocol so, so the thing is, you, you'll lose weight if you have unhealthy weight to lose. That's that's the key there. So it's not that everyone will lose weight. I, I, I gain weight very, very easily. I lost weight when I when I had excess weight to lose, but I only lose lost a bit. And then I sort of ended up maintaining my weight because I was replacing the fat that I was losing with the muscle that I was gaining. And so I actually stayed the same weight. I was I think I was around I, don't know. I mean, it fluctuated because you know, you know, water weight sort of fluctuated, and and, that, and that's the thing too, because you have you have, you know people look at again on the scale and they, they can fluctuate, especially with like a big guy, you know, you might fluctuate like you know five, ten pounds a day, you know, that 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 can easily happen. That happened to me a lot, and the reason I think is that obviously you're drinking more or less water, working out more or less, and losing more water, uh, but also because of depending on what plants and carbs you're eating, you are going to retain a different amount of water weight every single day. And I found out uh, just, in, and the reason I think that is because I was fluctuating all the time. And then I went like, oh, that's right. Plants are trying to kill me. Screw these things, stopped eating them. And I just went back to just eating meat. And I started I eat, I eat way more meat than I was doing before. I stopped eating all, all the greens. I wasn't eating any carbs, no sugar, no alcohol. It was just greens and meat and like a little amount of meat. And then I stopped the greens, massively increased the amount of meat that I was eating and way increased the fat that I was eating as well. I went from like 270, 275 ish, somewhere around there. And I dropped down to uh, like 243 and I was 243 every single day for months. And I, I did not change every single morning after I peed, I weighed the exact same amount. It was 243 pounds every single morning. Not a single day was it 242 or 244. It was 243 on the nose every single day. I was working out a lot. I was lifting weights. I, I, I was back playing rugby with um, you know, the Seattle Saracens, Seattle Seawolves when they were starting out. Um, and then just getting back into that, I was just back from doing humanitarian work in Bangladesh and, you know, as a volunteer doctor in the refugee camps there. And, uh, and I had not worked out in a very long time. And, uh, and so I was just pushing myself. So I lost a ton of weight just right away. I think most of that was water weight. I was just getting all this sort of crap out of my system, all this inflammation, all the, you know, different glycogen and everything like that. I was retaining a bunch of water. Now that's all out. And then I just maintained the exact weight that I, that I was, I was working out a lot. So I was putting on a lot of muscle mass and I was burning a lot of fat and it completely offset. And so I, I stayed exactly the same weight. And I was, I was happy with that um, because I could see what was going on. I could see that I was changing. I could see that I was putting on muscle. I could see that I was, that I was burning fat. So it, you will lose water weight. First of all. Yeah, absolutely. Like everyone will, because you have, you have pathological weight. You know, you've got, you know, when you're eating carbohydrates, this damages your body, your body spikes up this insulin it is a defense mechanism because it goes, sweet Jesus, what is this idiot done? He's trying to kill us all. And so it gets your <laughs> insulin up to try to just throw this stuff out of your, out of your bloodstream as quickly as possible. And so it's just, it's just trying to stuff it in, you know, every, every crevice that it can. And so it stores fat, it stores glycogen in your, in your, uh, uh liver, but also in your muscles. And it also it stores uh, fat in your muscles this is where you get, uh, marbling in a steak. That's from feeding the, the cow's grain. That happens to you too. If you eat grain, so you're getting intramuscular fat. And so these bodybuilders that eat a whole bunch of carbs and things like that, and they get these big puffy muscles. And then all of a sudden they lose 80 pounds of that when they're cutting Yeah, Gee, I wonder why, because half of those things are fat. They're intramuscular fat, and they also have a whole bunch of intramuscular glycogen. So you're going to lose that. And, and then they also 
bring water weight with them, especially the glycogen. And so you're going to lose that, you know, unnecessary pathological weight in that water weight and that intramuscular fat. Yeah, you lose that. But you want to lose that. You don't want to keep that crap. And then you're going to start stacking on weight. And you're going to stack on lean muscle mass, only lean muscle mass. You will not put on fatty muscle. It, it just won't happen. It can't happen physiologically if you look at the biochemistry of it. And uh, you know, I have, I have a degree in molecular and cellular biology. I took you know biochemistry 460. I can tell you this is how this is how the body works. And so when you do not eat carbs, you you are just in a completely different metabolic pro metabolic process. You're in a fat burning metabolism as opposed to a fat storage metabolism. And you put on lean muscle mass as opposed to fatty muscle mass. And which is not muscle mass, obviously, because it's in the name. So if you want to put on lean muscle mass, any, any, you know, any, any body style or shape, this is absolutely the way to do it. I put on muscle mass stupid easily. I mean, obviously I've been heavier weights. I've lifted weights a lot. I, you know, I played professional rugby for 10 years before uh, I, I, I went to medical school, as we were talking about before the show, you know, I, I, I did MMA and wrestling since I was a kid. I was training with, you know, Matt Hume at AMC kickboxing since I was 14. I was training with Josh Barnett. You know, he was my sparring partner when I was 17. He was in his mid twenties. And, uh, and, and, you know, I've done a lot of sports. I've put a lot of mass on my body. I'm able to sort of regain that pretty easily, but I've never done it easier than when I'm on carnivore. And when I'm, when, when I'm on carnivore and I can actually work out because I have no time to work out anymore. Uh, but my body just maintains, I just maintain my musculature and my body fat percentage because of the way I eat. And so everyone says like, how, how do you work out so much? I'm like, I work out less than you. I guarantee it. And, um, anyway, they don't, they don't believe me, but it's true. You know, I, I really haven't like worked out properly in I, at least a month. I mean, I haven't, I haven't really done any, I haven't been in the gym in two months easily. I've been doing sort of X3 band workouts. Um, but I had to, I had to stop because I, um, uh, I've just been, uh, I wasn't able to sort of, uh, maintain that just because of, of my work and everything like that. So, um, but I'm able to maintain this body, you know, my body composition just because of what I eat. And when I do work out and I work out hard because I know how to work out hard, I will put on, and I eat enough. That's the key thing is eating enough. I will, I will put on a pound, sometimes two pounds. Every time I go to the gym, like I just step on the scale, I'm like a pound up, pound and a half up, pound up, pound up, pound up, two pounds up. And it's like, it's kind of, it's kind of funny. It's like a video game. You're just like going for the high score, you know, <laughs> to see how you can go. And it's just, it's just lean muscle mass. You know, I'm not putting on any fat. And so that's, that's the main thing. If you want to, you're going to lose weight initially because you're just going to lose, you know, unnecessary water weight and, uh, and unhealthy weight, pathological weight. And then you're going to stack on lean muscle mass. And if you just work out hard, you lift weights hard, train hard, and you eat enough so that your body can rebuild what you've broken down, then you will, you will absolutely stack on weight. That's not a problem. It's, it'd be easier than you've ever, ever done it before. And on that, on the counterintuitive side, just to stress this and to uh, let everybody know, including myself, when you say eat enough, you are indeed talking about fat and you are indeed mm. talking about protein, <clears throat> which is, you know, that's your steak right there. And that's the psychological um, hurdle that we all have to get over is eating that fat and trusting, trusting the body, trusting the science um, and and weaning off if, if you have to, or some people like cold Turkey, but you know, some people like weaning off the carbs. That's kind of where I've been in the last month has been slowly letting the carbs go and increasing the meat and the red meat and trying not to cut around the white, the white fat, go ahead and include the fat and get the calories that way, the counterintuitive side. But for anyone who's listening, if they're listening kind of with that, intuitive side of them, if you will. Uh, it, it's almost like I'm remembering what you're saying, even though I've never been visited with this before. As you're saying it, there's almost like an evolutionary remembering for me. And it's almost, um, in a way, I don't want to sound dramatic, but it's almost emotional because it's like, oh my God, I, I want to apologize to my body. You know, I want to apologize for <laughs> the shite that I've shoveled into it for so long my intentions were good. My intentions were good. I, you know, there was no malintent there. I, I was trying to follow what the pros were telling me to do. And, um, 
you know, I was mixing up my, my carbs and my proteins, trying to, you know, keep that, you know, trying to stay anabolic. And, uh, but what you really, had, you really answered a question for me. And that is, can I gain muscle mass and maintain my weight and clean up the crap? And that's, that's health. That's life right there. What you're talking about. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And you, and you do it in a healthy way. And that's, that's really the important thing. He said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I don't really want to be big and bulky at the expense of my health and longevity. I just don't, that's not, in, that doesn't interest me. You know, I mean, there are people that make that sacrifice, you know, like linemen in the NFL, they're like, look, I'm, I'm feeding my family. I'm setting up, I'm, I'm, you know, setting down, uh, you know, uh, you know, a stake for my kids and my family forever. And like, if I die young, I die young, but I'm doing this for my family, you know, good on them. You don't need to, you don't need to do it that way. You can do it. There's, there's a better way where you can get better results and better health. And it's, and just like, it was just unreal. My fitness level was, was better than, than anything that anyone else around me, I, I could not get tired. I could not run out of energy. I, I couldn't get sore. I don't get sore anymore from working out. That's all from the, you know, the defense chemicals and, and uh, inflammatory processes in, in the plants that cause you to be sore. So I don't get sore anymore. That's something that most athletes will just call bullshit on, but like try it two weeks, two weeks without eating any plants, carbs or coffee, you will see, you will not get sore. It doesn't matter how hard you work out. I did 32 sets of squats because I thought it was bullshit too. And I could not get sore. Okay. Wow. You cannot get sore if you don't eat plants uh, and coffee's a plant. So people, people don't re recognize that, but I drank one cup of coffee and I was sore for two damn days afterwards. And so it's <laughs> like, you know, it makes a difference. You know, yeah, the so, coffee one is hard for a lot of people, myself included, hmm. but yeah, it's a plant, isn't it? Yeah. And it's, it's a bean and a bean is a seed and a seed is a plant's baby and everything protects its babies more than anything. And so in seeds, you'll generally find the highest concentration of poisons. And that's just, that's just how that, that goes. And so beans and seeds and nuts and, you know, legumes, all these things, uh, that's, that, that's going to have most of the poisons in there. And so those are, those are going to be quite harmful. And so, you know, you roast it and you do these sorts of things and that denatures some of the poisons that makes it, uh, more palatable, but it doesn't make them completely safe. You know I mean? A lot of these things like kidney beans, normal ass kidney beans, you know, if you don't, if you don't soak those and boil those, the lectins in there will make you horribly sick. And you need, another, and you need like, you know, like five of these things will make you horribly sick. And, you know, a few more than that can actually kill you. Okay. That, those are, those are, that's a staple diet for most people, you know, but if you don't boil, them, you know, for a minimum amount of time, like that's it, that's it for you. You're done. You know, I mean, think of ricin, you know, that, that comes from, you know, like, was it castor beans or something like that? You know, it's like, yeah, that's just like the, you know, the, the shell, the skin shell around uh, castor beans, you know, ricin, that is just, that is invariably fatal. That like gets on your skin, it'll get in your body, you will die, you know? That's, that's how plants work. You know, they're living organisms. They don't want to die. They don't want to be eaten. You know, we're not in the garden of Eden. We're just not. And so, you know, we, we don't have all these plants here, just, just here, just, just waiting for us. They're there to, to procreate and they're there to live their own lives and us eating them, you know, diminishes that and, or, or you know, makes them go extinct. If they, if they were all, if they didn't have any defenses, they wouldn't be here. You know, life is kill or be killed for, for plants as well as animals. And so if they don't have that, those defenses, they're gone. And so uh, a major part of that are these poisons. You know, animals can run away or fight back. They have kinetic defenses. And so they generally don't need to be poisonous, but some are. I mean, think of like, you know, insects like, you know, uh, monarch butterflies or viceroy butterflies, they're toxic to birds. And so, you know, they see those yellow pattern, the bird just goes, Ooh, not going to eat that thing. You know, different frogs, the same thing. They have these, these bright colors and be like, don't eat me, I'll kill you. And, and that's fine. You know, cow doesn't have that, you know, cow doesn't need that. It's, it's a big, strong animal. They've got a pack. They've got, you know, or, you know, big uh, you know, herd of them. They have the you know, herd, you know, uh, uh, protection and they have big horns and oh, they will try, they will stomp you into the dust if they think that you're going to hurt them. And so that's their defenses. They don't need to be physically poisonous like a shrub does. You know, and so that's, that's the thing. And so, you know, a plant needs to be poisonous because it doesn't, it, it can't run away. It can't beat you up if you try to kill it or kill its children, you know? So that's, that's just, that's just the reality. That's just the biology. And this is, this is not me making this up. This is in any botany book you care to look at, 
any botany professor will tell you that, oh yeah, plants use poisons. Absolutely, every single one of them, without question. Now, does that mean that we can't eat any of them safely? Like, well, define safely. You know, I mean, you can survive and you can, you know, and, and you can you know, potentially even do pretty well, but you know, it, you will get some detriment from this. And there's ways of mitigating this. There's you know, tons of different uh, uh, peoples and tribes that, that know how to process plants to make them less poisonous. You know, cassava root, these are, these are, this is the third most important calorie source in the third world. If you don't process that correctly, it has enough cyanide in it, it will kill you. You're dead. Hmm. Okay. So they have, they have a special way of processing it to, you know, get out most of the, the cyanide in it. Right. But there's still some cyanide in it. You get thyroid damage, neurotoxicity, other sorts of damage from that eating this stuff, you know, uh, long-term and they do get this stuff, you know, that's, that's the problem. So it's not 100% safe. Never. It is never 100% safe. And so, you know, that's something that we just have to contend with. That, that is just the, the simple biology of it. Hey, if the cow is eating poisonous plants, how does that poison not translate over? Does the, pot, does the cow filter the poisons for us and there, therefore the, the meat's not dangerous? Yeah. yeah, no, very good question. Yeah, so, so you know, I, I learned in seventh grade biology that plants and animals are in an evolutionary arms race. Plants becoming more and more poisonous, so less and less animals can eat them. But then animals becoming more and more adapted to specific poisons and specific plants, so they could eat that plant and those poisons and break them down safely, and so they can survive and thrive. And that becomes their dedicated resource. You know, this is why koalas eat eucalyptus; nothing else eats eucalyptus. You know, and they don't eat anything else either because they're adapted to breaking down uh, the poisons in eucalyptus safely. And so they can eat those safely, but they don't have the same defenses to like, say, you know, spinach. So, you know, like spinach will kill a koala, eucalyptus will kill us, right? Because we have different, you know, genetic ad adaptations. So that, that's exactly it. It's not just that those poisons don't harm them. It's that they're able to break them down safely. And so they break them down into harmless byproducts and they get rid of them and they filter them out. So that's uh, also an important point when you're thinking about eating these animals, because if you have a koala, it's easy eating a bunch of, you know, things that it's not supposed to, it's not going to be breaking down those poisons as well. And so, yeah, so it's not going to be as healthy. So you have a cow that's eating, you know, things it's not supposed to, it, it'll, you know, a cow still can't eat most plants. Most can't, plants will kill a cow, you know, it can eat grass. And not even all grasses. Some grasses are, are bad for cows. So I eat specific grasses and I eat specific other plants that, that taste good. And that's, that's a good marker. If something tastes bitter, your brain is recognizing there's something in there that's bad for you. You should not eat it. You know, so any bitter plants, anything you give to an infant and it spits out and cries, you should not be putting in your mouth because they're much more you know, closely related to their, um, you know, their genetics. And so they're recognizing something, oh, this is bad for me. You gotta be safe. Don't, you know, don't eat this, you're gonna die. And um, so that, that is exactly what's happening with, um, with the toxins in the plants is that, you know, the cow and the herbivore, the, the, the animal that's designed to eat this thing uh, or has, has co-evolved with this plant has the, the ability to break down those poisons safely and get rid of them. So now those, those, those poisons are gone, you know, by and large, you know, like apparently like the bone marrow of a koala is actually super toxic <laughs> so like you can you can eat like the meat of a of a koala but like there's a bunch of uh, eucalyptus toxins that uh, store up in the in the bone marrow apparently uh that uh will, will get you so yeah you do have to sort of be aware of that but like you know a cow does a very good job you know ruminant animals this is why a lot of people that do carnivore or do any sort of meat-based uh diet approach they, they often go for ruminants and they find that athletically, physically, mentally, they feel a lot better with ruminant animals. I've, I've certainly found the same way. I definitely feel best on beef, especially grass fed beef, uh, even though, you know, studies are pretty equivocal on, you know, do these things, is there much a difference? Um, maybe, maybe not, but, you know, it also depends on what your long-term markers are uh, as well, but, you know, there are going to be some differences. And so, you know, if you're, if you're looking for optimal, 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 then, you know, definitely eating the cow that's eating what it's supposed to be eating is the, is the way to go. But ruminants in general are much better able to break down toxic elements in plants and get and extract the nutrients out of them. So they are going to be 
they're going to have better digestion and they're going to have, you know, better meat as a result. That seems to be uh, the case. Wow. So important to remind the folks at home, um, fat is not an issue. It's actually a positive. Don't sweat it when the numbers of the LDL are high. Do not sweat that. Don't let that panic you as long as the other elements are in place. No more poison, just clean fat, clean protein. And I don't know if you saw, um, this was another thing that kind of made me start thinking about doing this more seriously. Uh, Jordan Peterson was just on Rogan. Mm-hmm. And here's what the carnivore protocol, and he's like you, he's strict. He, there's no playing around. Like he, this is, this is his life and he takes it seriously. He's strict. He doesn't play around. Here's what it fixed for Jordan Peterson. Cured his depression, his snoring, his gum disease. He had gastric reflux disorder. He had psoriasis. He had eye floaters. You know, those little buggies you see in your eyes. Um, appetite fell by 70% fixed his blood dysregulation, needed way less sleep. And I noticed that too, when I was doing it, because I I did do it for 48 hours clean. I popped out of bed at like five. I couldn't sleep anymore. (laughs) And I did not have, I've had on and off sciatica. I popped out of bed. And usually I feel the sciatica in the morning and a little bit of old man-itis walk into the bathroom. The kids make fun of me. You know, I'm a little hunched over, you know, like an old man. I popped out of bed, no sciatica whatsoever. Uh, the uh, the mood impressed, and his leg numbness went away. He went from now he's he now here's the one digression in in but based on what you said earlier, this is fixable. He went from two twelve to one sixty two, so he was happy with that. He was like, "Hey man, I I want to be a lean mean fight machine. I'm good with one sixty two. He didn't like the two twelve. But when he lost all that water weight and all that poison, he went to 162, but he's six foot two. And to me, in my eyes, 162 is starting to get to that number that doesn't look good. And I know, again, this is ego and psychology and all that other stuff, but it's a factor. 162 to me, I would tell Jordan, don't lose any more weight, bro. You better start eating more fat and more protein and start, you know, hitting the weights because it ain't going to look good. But Again, like you said, who needs to be big and puffy if you're going to feel fabulous, right? You're going to feel, you're going to, it's going to make you, it's going to fix stuff. Like my, my cognitive issues, I've been having a lot of brain fog and I can't find certain words. You can probably see it here. And just in this interview, I I'm searching for words at times that would normally in the past easily come to me. So I've got to do this. And I think there's probably a lot of people who are listening to this, like it's game set and match. Got to do it. You don't have a choice. It's life, bro. You're talking, what you're talking about is life. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the only one we got, you know, and, and so you might as well live it to the max and, and live it to maximal health. And you know, some people will say, you know, the counter to that say, well, because the only, I only have one life, I want to, you know, eat crap and eat pizza. And so what if I, you know, I die early and it's like, yeah, well, you can do that. And you know, people make that same excuse with heroin and meth, you know, and that's, then that's their choice. That's their life. They can do that. You know, oh, you can't say that, you know, heroin and meth are like pizza. Like the hell I can't. I'm a doctor. And I actually study this. Have you? You know, I spent the last 22 years looking into this. You know, sugar is a drug. It gives a it gives a, a, a dopamine response to the addiction centers of your brain, just like cocaine, heroin, and meth. And it kills the same areas of your brain as meth to the same extent as meth. There are MRI studies showing that. It also breaks down into the same byproducts as alcohol. So you get the same damage to your brain as meth and the same damage to your body as alcohol. Tell me that's not a drug again you know, and with a straight face, you know, that's garbage. Just because we don't, we don't recognize it as a drug, just we don't recognize it as a poison does not mean that it isn't. Okay. It just means that, you know, we're ignorant to that fact. Okay. But by any strict medical definition that it absolutely is a drug, it is a toxic addictive drug and it should absolutely be regulated and, 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 and age restricted. I absolutely think that sugar should be age restricted. I mean, especially for kids, you know, I mean, we're, we're linking, uh, you know, sugar and fructose to the development of Alzheimer's and dementia, right? You know, that that's that's causing a degradation and breakdown into an adult mature healthy brain. What's that doing to a, a, a developing brain? What's that doing to a fetus? You know, it's not going to be good. All right. Whatever it's doing, it's not going to help. All right. And then you, you're getting these kids addicted to these things. There's sugar in everything, There's sugar in baby formula. They know what they're doing. You know, the sugar companies damn well know what they're doing. They know this stuff is addicted. They've known this stuff is addictive for a very long time. That's why they, they increase the amount of salt and sodium 
in a product so that that hides the taste of sugar so they can add more sugar to it. All right. That's where there's a ton of salt in Coca-Cola because the more salt they have in, the more sugar they can offset it with. That's what new Coke was. New Coke went way more salt, way more sugar, but it just, it was a bit weird. And people were like, mm, I don't like it. And so they had to go back to Coke classic. That's what it was about. They knew exactly what they were doing, you know? So it is absolutely as bad. You know, I mean, first of all, I mean, let, let, let's just be real here. Like, you know, opiates, we use these in medicine all the time. We have people with chronic pain, they get put on long-term opiates for 40 years, 50 years. It does not actually cause significant harm to your body like sugar does, like carbohydrates do. Carbohydrates cause heart disease, cancer, uh, autoimmune disorders, uh, disorders, Alzheimer's. They cause huge damage to your body. And so I, you know, I, I don't think for a second that um, you know, it's any, any better than doing drugs. Probably get a more bang for your buck from the heroin and then you do from sugar, certainly. And so uh, it's not something that uh, I would ever put. I would, I mean, I'm never gonna put heroin in my body. So I'm sure as hell not gonna put uh, sugar in my body. Just as a reminder, we're talking with Dr. Anthony Chafee, who is a medical doctor specializing in medical science and neurosurgical resident in Perth, Australia. And uh, this perhaps my favorite title that I've seen in 10 years for a podcast. The name of this podcast is The Plant Free MD. And when I first saw that title, I was like, I was like, you know how Scooby Doo does a huh? Like he's like, it's just a <laughs> cognitive disruptor because it just to see those two se sentences together, those that that structure of word plant free and MD is is cognitive dissonance at its greatest and you have been done such a great job dr chafee of explaining why you're you're feeling that uh, that the meat protocol is is the, the the big solve for all of the the biggest ailments uh affecting the world population so thank you once again for your time and i also i also know you're in perth so you're you're 12 hours ahead it's 11 45 a.m east coast stateside so at any time you want to tap out let me know um i think i'm getting the benefit of your protocol because your energy hasn't waned one bit <laughs> it's almost midnight and your energy hasn't aged so so uh the the viewers and listeners of for the fighter and you are benefiting uh, right off the bat with this nutritional protocol because you've been able to give us such high level science and and you're disseminating in such a layman terms in such layman terms that it's it's very easy for us to understand uh, for me i'll call myself the layman i'm not gonna call anyone else the layman but for me to understand if it, look if a knucklehead like me is understanding mm -hmm. you, you're doing a really good job of explaining yeah. this uh quick question for you because you had mentioned brine earlier um how do you feel about the ferments hmm. like for fermenting uh meat yeah, or like plants fermenting or like i like to ferment my own up until now, you know, I haven't known about this vegetable thing, but I've always been a fan for the last 10 years of fermenting my vegetables, mm -hmm. um, you know, for digestion and for uh, the probiotics, helping my microbiome. What do you feel about ferments, you know, miso and kraut and kefir and, and yogurt? Are you a fan mm -hmm. or, or how, how, how does that land in the carnivore space? Well, you know, you know, fermenting, you know, dairy products is, is absolutely, you know, something that we've been doing for thousands and thousands of years and uh, is quite, it's quite beneficial. And you look at like the, you know, the Mongolians, uh, like, like Genghis Khan, the Mongol horde, those, those, they were all carnivores. They just ate horse meat, drank horse blood and fermented horse milk products. And, uh, and they, they conquered the known world. You know, they took over most of Asia, most of Europe and is the largest contiguous empire that's ever existed, 100% carnivores. And that, and you actually read books on Genghis Khan and, and why they were so successful. That's something that they actually note is that they were very well fed. They were very well nourished. They didn't have to you know, have a bunch of cook fires. They didn't have to stop to cook four times a day like other armies. And they, you know, they could just go, you know, they would, they would go, they would, they wouldn't eat for five days in a row. Then they'd eat 10 pounds of horse meat, do it again, you know? And so they didn't need to cook fires. They moved very fast. And they could move an army very, very fast. They were very well nourished. They were very, you know, athletic. They could do a lot more, and um, they didn't need to keep stopping eating. 
They need to make a bunch of cook fires. They didn't have this massive army of, of cook fires that you could see, you know, 50 miles away. So you could see exactly when these guys were coming. They had no idea. So the Mongols knew exactly where he was going, wham, right in there. Oh God, here they are, you know, and they, and they had such a huge advantage. So that's something they've been doing for a long time. They still do it. And you look at like, you know, there's only small, well, I think it's like 30% of people around the world are, aren't lactose intolerant. They've, they've, you know, adapted to being able to use lactose. And I think it's something like that. And, um, you know, but, uh, that's not something that that's been historical. We haven't always been like that. You know, that, that's a, that's a more recent adaptation, uh, is being able to deal with lactose as an adult, obviously as kids, we can do it. Um, but, you know, and you would think like, you know, like the Maasai in Africa, you know, they, they, they drink a lot of milk, and uh, so they actually, you know, they're fine with this sort of stuff. And you'd think that the Mongolians, they would be one of these people that have this adaptation. They would be very good with lactose. In fact, they don't. They, they don't. They're one of the worst. They can't process it at all. But that's because they ferment the hell out of it. So all their stuff is fermented. They don't have any dairy with lactose in it. It's all, it's all used up by the bacteria. And so that's, that's historically a very good way of reducing the toxins and, and extrapolating more nutrients out of heretofore less nutritious, more toxic uh, things like plants, you know? So, you know, uh, fermenting soy, you know, people talk about, you know, like, oh, soy, it's all this superfood. First of all, no, it's not. It's super bad for you. It's like absolutely toxic. And there's like, you know, there's, there's enough, there's enough estrogen in soy that eight glasses of soy milk a day is enough estrogen to grow breasts in a man. All right. Wow. So wow. that's, you know, that's, a, so if that's not something you want, if you're not trying to grow breasts, not anytime, would, not anytime that. soon, it's really well, hasn't I mean, been on my radar. Well, you know, it's, it's 2022, man. Like everyone's, everyone's doing their own thing <laughs> yeah. now. And, uh, so, you know, but if that's not something you want, then, you know, maybe you want, want to think try it twice about, you know, that, that soy milk latte. Right. So, uh, but you know, even in, in China, they say, "Oh, yeah, they always use soy." Actually, it was it was sort of a disaster sort of thing. It was like if they had to, they would eat soy, and it was always fermented. It was for fermented soy uh, products. It was not just straight up soy. And so, uh, there's a lot of things that that go through these processes. And fermentation is is a is a very important process to break down and um, certain chemicals, and also make things more. Uh, bioavailable because plants are just not very bioavailable. And so fermentation is a very good process for that. So if you are going to eat plants and you have to eat these things to survive or, you know, milk and things like that, then fermentation is, is a very good way of doing that. If you have the choice though, uh, I would just avoid the whole situation uh, altogether and just eat meat. But, you know, yeah, that, that is something that can be utilized. So I, I don't, you know, necessarily do that myself because I just, I feel best on meat. I'm able to access meat. And so I will do that. And I'm, I don't plan on ever eating any plants ever again, unless I have to, to survive. And if I'm not going to starve to death, I'm not going to eat a plant. <laughs> I'm just not going to, but if I am in that situation and, uh, and I'm able to ferment and get, uh, and, and do it properly, then yeah, I, I would absolutely do that. Because they are, it does create some probiotics. And, um, from what I understand, you never really lose the diversity of your microbiome when you switch over to meat only. They just become dormant. Um, and then you grow new buggies, right? Who are much, I say who like they're people, but I guess they kind of are people. They, they yeah. tell us what to do a lot. Um, but you grab, you, you, you grow those new buggies that are fermenters of fat and protein. Is that correct? Yeah, you, you will change you. Yeah, you absolutely change your, your microbiome and you, you have a very diverse microbiome. And this, this has been shown with recent experiments, people, people doing, you know, getting the microbiome checked, they, you know, as carnivores and, and it's very diverse and, and it's all the different kinds of, mi of microbes that are very, very beneficial. And there's actually a lot of, of microbes. Um, oh gosh, what was it? Damn it. I just read a paper on this um, that talks about the the different gut biome that actually was that was linked to like certain disease processes uh, i forget exactly what it was i don't want to just just um guess something incorrectly but anyways it was you know major disease process and we had found this strong link to this uh gut by uh microbe and and they found that people that had this microbe had very high correlation of having of developing this sort of illness and people that didn't have it 
basically just you were protected from that. And, and this was something that was, that was fed by like carbs and fiber. And so like people that basically did not eat carbs and fiber, those, those bacteria would die off. And so you basically be very protected from that. Not to say that you will definitely get this other disease. It's just, it just increases your likelihood of it. That's what, you know, these correlations are, but when you didn't um, eat the carbs or the fiber, you didn't have this micro microbe. And they found that people that didn't have that microbe were very, were, were much more protected against it. So um, you end up getting a very diverse microbiome, but it's also in, in, the, in the better kinds of microbes that you want as well, and which stands to reason because this is how we're supposed to eat. And so, you know, it it's, it's, makes sense that we would foster, develop and maintain and support a microbiome that's beneficial to us, right? And, and oral and and um, digestive, you know, we you have a very different oral microbiome as well. And this is why you don't really get the plaque and the tartar and the gum disease and the cavities and things like that. You know, like like cavemen did not get cavities. They had perfectly formed teeth, perfectly you know, massive, big, wide jaws. They all got their wisdom teeth in. Like oh, almost everyone got their wisdom teeth up until like very recently, and um, you know, and that and that's and that's a nutritional thing. You know, we know from dent, there's a bunch of dentistry journals that show that crooked teeth and small jaws and not developing our wisdom teeth properly is 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 nutritional. Not it's usually like vitamin K. You're not getting enough vitamin K two, uh, but it's also K one, calcium, D three, all these things, and and you know, chewing and different sorts of uh, things that you do during development that help with proper development of the jaw and the teeth and the mouth and the palate. And, but a large part of this is nutritional. It's not genetic. All of our genes are set to have big, strong, wide jaws with full rows of straight teeth. That is our genetics. Okay. And it, and it's environmental when we don't get that. And also cavities, we can actually date skulls um, before or after the agricultural revolution based on their dentition. You know, they get like crooked, nasty teeth, they're a bunch of cavities and rotting and falling out, small jaws, or big, strong, wide jaws, full teeth, not a single cavity, you know? And so you have, you have a different oral microbiome as well. And so yeah, you, you will uh, get the most out of your, your microbiome as well by being on a carnivore diet. I noticed that as well, doctor, when I did my test. So I spoke earlier about springing out of bed at five and being really clear headed. I noticed I remembered my dreams, which I normally don't. I don't remember my dreams anymore. And I remembered all my dreams and I sprung out of bed at five. And then the other thing I noticed besides the no sciatica was mm -hmm. I didn't have that white coat over my tongue that mm -hmm. I used to have. And my teeth felt clean. They felt just as clean in the morning as they felt going to bed after I brushed my teeth, they felt just as clean. Whereas normally I'd have to brush again in the morning. I had to actually make myself brush. I didn't feel like I needed to. And I was a little mental note that I made to myself. I said, there are changes. So what you're talking about, like, I know this is anecdotal, but anybody who knows me knows I tell it like it is. I noticed changes. My stomach flattened out. I sprung out of bed. I had a clear head all day long. My teeth didn't feel dirty. So just like the things you're talking about, I can, I can support and say, yeah, this is what happened with me. And so I like, I'm after this conversation, I am so committed to this. I am so jumping all in doing a ribeye. When we, yeah. when we finish up here, I'm doing a ribeye. I'll probably throw a couple eggs in and you know, here's the other benefit. I spent 10 years delicately getting the yolk out of my eggs, right? Yeah. You, you're juggling them like this, trying to get the yolk out without losing the egg white, making egg whites. Mm -hmm. And I did it for 10 years. And then someone, someone yelled at me. They're like, dude, the yolk is the best part of the egg. What are you doing? And I'm like, yeah. this is what I was told to do. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, that's the thing though. You know, people, I, I, I've heard doctors and it's usually like, you know, fat out of shape doctors that say like, oh, you know, people are out of shape, you know, fat and overweight because they just don't listen to doctors. They just don't listen to the advice. I'm like, uh, no idiot. You know, it's because they did listen to your stupid <laughs> advice. You know, it's like, are you taking your own advice? Obviously not very good, you know, because it's, it's not getting you anywhere. <clears throat> you know, the problem is people did listen, you know, we were talking before about, you know, um, people are compliant. Really no one wants to die. No one wants well, yeah, to die. Thing, you know, people are trying to do the right thing. They're all trying to do the right thing by themselves and by the, by, you know, their, their fellow man and the, and the world around them. And this is why they get suckered into these false causes 
you know, based on this false information. They said, this is going to save your life. This is going to save your health. This is going to save the world. It's going to save the environment or the planet. All bullshit, all bullshit. And it's just pushed by people that are making tr trillions with a T of dollars off of you. The sugar company, sugar industry makes $2.4 trillion a year, every year, mm. just selling sugar, just sugar. Mm. All right. And mm. so, you know, th this is, oh, no, sorry, $1.3 trillion a year. And then the medical industry, we then pay $2.4 trillion a year, just treating the effects of sugar consumption, just sugar. Okay. So, you know, I mean, think about how much money that that's back in the system, in the economic, in, in the economy going towards useful directions, you know, where that's going to drive innovation. That's going to be, you know, that's going to be absolutely revolutionary getting that, uh, that those resources back into useful directions instead of just buying poison and then treating the poison. I mean, this is stupid. I mean, we're literally spinning our wheels and we're, and we're no better off for it. Um, so, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, um, I lost where I was going with that, but anyway, I was saying that like, uh, you know, th this can, you know, this, yeah, well, we're, you know, we were, we were talking about just how crazy it is that like anybody can self-test. Um, yeah. and I am not saying this is easy now for me personally, it's, it's hard, but most of mine are the psychological aspects for me. It's the, I start feeling almost catabolic when i'm making the transition and i don't know what that is it's something about the carbs it's giving me some kind of signal um i i've noticed in the past if i do juice myself with a little bit of carb the night before maybe i'm loading up my liver or i'm loading up my my tissue and my workout is a little more robust so I, that's something i've i need to get over i need to somehow find that glycogen kick because i go heavy you know, it's kind of a CrossFit type of um, functional type of working out, but I use real, real heavy weights, uh, big, you know, I do like a big anti-aging protocol. I do my big muscle groups, my glute, my quads, and I hit them hard. And uh, that's one of the, my paranoia is if I go hundred percent carnivore, that will I have that, whatever it is, that kick, the glycogen, mm -hmm. that fast twitch, you're the perfect guy to ask about that because you've been able to do this 20 years and you haven't lost size. So for the mm. hard gainers, uh, you're the perfect guy to ask about that, that, that quick yeah. twitch functional. You were a professional rugby player for goodness sake. Talk about mm. explosive. That's the perfect yeah. combination. You had to be aerobic and anaerobic and, you know, while someone's yeah. trying to knock your head off. So, yeah. well, well, I was trying to knock their head off. That was, that was my MO. It was, <laughs> just... What I position just, I, did you play? Uh, I played in the back row. So I played like open side flanker and eight man. And um, so that was always my favorite. And then, but I was also fast enough. I played a lot of sevens as well. And so I played like in the centers in sevens. Uh, so I, I played like sort of yeah, sevens in centers as well. And, you know, sometimes went out on the wing just to, just to mess with people. But, um, you know, because I, I was fast enough as well, but like, there wasn't enough action there. Like I wanted to hit people. And so I liked, I liked being in the back row and especially at, at, at number seven open side flanker, because I could just get out there and, and just, you know, I just tried to punish people. I, I, I was very defensively oriented when I played uh, open side flanker. And I just tried to, I tried to, take out as many people as I could take them out of the game just by tackling. I never played dirty. I never like, you know, stomp people on the ground or punch people or hit people uh, in a dirty way. I played, I hit him. I played with every, every ounce of everything, but within, you know, the rules of the game. And uh, by doing that, I was still able to, uh, you know, take a lot of people out of the game and just, just hit them so hard that they just did not get back up and they had to be subbed out. And that was, that was what I like to do. And if I didn't, if I had open side flanker, like the fly half, um, which means nothing to people if people don't play rugby, but if people do, they know that, you know, open side flanker, the fly half is your enemy. That's your sworn enemy. And so like, if, if I didn't take the fly half out of the game, I consider, consider that a failure. Like I, it doesn't matter how much we run by. <laughs> if I didn't take the fly half out of the game, like I, I consider it a loss. And like the best thing, the best feeling in the world, I knew I was doing well was when I go down, I bind onto the scrum. I look down and then I look up and the first thing I do is look right at the fly half because like I'm coming for your ass. And, uh, and after a while they'd be back looking at me. Like I'd look up at them all of a sudden they're looking at me going <laughs> like, shit, he's coming. <laughs> and so I was just like, I'm in his head. I've got him. And, um, yeah, it didn't, it wasn't too long after that before they, they, they weren't able to make it, but 
Um, the last yeah, two far, times far as... I was in Sydney, because um, we have friends there, and uh, I, I always, and Paul he always takes me, treats me to Aussie rules football or a rugby game, and I got turned into a mad addict. Uh, mm -hmm. and because we don't have all the stops like in American football and I love American football, but you realize how many times, <clears throat> how much a stop and action there is in the NFL. When you go yeah. to a rugby game, it's just nonstop action, moving the ball up and down the field. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'll tell you, it grows some amazing bodies. Like you, if you ever mm -hmm. want to see the most jacked, perfectly proportional dudes go to an Aussie rule football they all look like male models, but they look like thick, thick male models, not like, you know, 160 pound male models. They're 220 yeah. pound male models, but their proportionality yeah. is amazing. Their quads, their glutes, everything, you know, just about, they're so jacked. They look so good. And, uh, you know, like I realized, okay, that it's that explosive, uh, it, that anti aging explosion that you have. Like I just talked to Dr. Kilson. He's not a, he's not big on sprinting. Actually, that brings up a, a question. Where are you on the, on the exercise side in terms of sprinting versus just kind of more, if you, you, he thought it was too inflammatory. I said, yeah, but it's yeah. so evolutionary. You, you got to catch the deer, right? You got to, it's, it, mm. it's telling your body, you still need that, those muscles. And like, if you're, mm. if you're using them in a sprint, isn't your body going to release growth hormone and pres try to preserve that muscle? Well, you, you're also going to go into anaerobic uh, work as well, which is going to trigger testosterone, trigger growth hormone. It's going to suppress cortisol as well. Whereas doing aerobic, long-term aerobic running is uh, going to do the opposite. It's going to increase your cortisol and it's going to you know, suppress your growth hormone and, uh, and growth, uh, growth hormone and, and testosterone as well. So, um, you know, even just from a side, from a, you know, not, not looking at it from a, like a physiological point, I just really like sprinting because I've just found that for me as an athlete, it really does a lot for me. I feel really good. I feel more athletic when I'm sprinting a lot, when I'm dynamic and I'm, I'm athletic and I'm explosive. I just feel better. I'm just walking around. I know that any second, boom, take off and do something. And that's actually a really good feeling. I like having that feeling. And then obviously in sports, that's, that's, that's what you do. You know I mean, that's what you have to do. And so I really like that. I really like sprinting. I like hill sprinting. I like stair sprinting. I really like, you know, like the big stadium steps, just sprinting up those, doing the sort of plyometric sort of big leaping jump sprints, everything like that. I like those. I really like those a lot. Um, and a lot of, of resistance training. Um, that's ma the majority of what I do is, is that I don't have much time to do any of it anymore, but even when I was you know playing rugby, I never just went on runs. I thought there was just bored me to tears. So I would go like, well, I do like wind sprints. So I go down to like, in you know, the Kirkland waterfront and there'd be like these mile markers it was like every half mile, there was like a mile mark or like a half mile sort of marker. And so I would just, I would just run hard and I hit one of those and I just be a dead sprint for half a mile, hard as I could for half a mile. And then I just you know, sort of jog this one. I was like, Oh, I actually felt good. I'll do, I'll sprint the whole mile and just do that. And like do that. So I just sprint on off. Whole off. So mile. I just, wow. Mm. Well, you know, like Matt Hume actually like, like broke that into me because like when, when I was in high school training with him, we went up to like the high school track um, with, with the whole AMC crew. And um, we ran up from AMC to Lake Washington high school, which is like, I don't know, you know sort of three miles away two three, four miles away, something like that. Uh, from from AMC, and I didn't know what we were doing, uh, so I was a bit of a jackass, and I was in you know it was a decent shape, and um, so we're all running up there, we're all sort of running at our own pace, we're running up up to Lake Washington, and so I was sort of up at the front with Matt and a few others, and it's sort of like the last sort of like half mile, I just sort of picked it up, and I ended up going and and beating Matt. I thought I just thought I was just beating. I was like, oh, look at me. You know, I beat Matt. Look, I'm so great. Didn't say there'll it. be he's, a price to pay guy. for that later on the mats, but yeah, but <laughs> absolutely. But, you know, he's a very humble guy. I mean, he he knows who he is. He knows that he's you know so much better than just any human being has ever lived, and so he doesn't he doesn't need to prove something to some you know you know you know teenage kid, and. And, um, but I got there and I'm just sort of bouncing around, like all happy that, you know, I was, I was the first one there. And then we actually did the real workout because I was not aware that we actually, that was just getting to the workout. This was the real workout. We went to the, we went to the track and he said, you can jog around the curves. 
But when you hit the straights of the, of the track, quarter mile track, you have to be at a dead sprint. You have to, you hit that line, you're bang, you're going everything you, you can and try to line up with someone next to you and you can sprint and you try to, and you race each other and you try to go and beat it. And then you get to that other line, then you can slow it down. You can run, jog, you know, walk or crawl as long as you keep moving. And then as soon as you get to that new line, you do it as hard as you can and you just go and you just keep doing this. And oh my God, we just, we just did this for hours, just hours, man, just hours. Wow. And we, we ended up doing this. And so it was just like, we, and we kept moving, kept going. I, I pushed myself really hard, but man, I was just dragging around the, you know, after several miles of this, you know, like around the curves, I was just, we're just dragging, dragging and we get to the front and we just burn it out. And Matt never slowed down. Like the dude never slowed down. He lapped each of us a dozen times, at least. I don't even know how many times. He just, just kept cruising by us, just constantly, constantly, constantly. It was just like, oh my, it was just getting embarrassing. And he just, <laughs> he just showed us just how much, just, just like how just weak we all were compared to him, you know? Like, yes, and uh, oh my God. And he just, he just kept going, just kept going and kept going and kept going. And this is, this is when he was, you know, still sort of fighting, you know, and like, and, um, you know, so he was, dude was just in such good shape. And then we ran back to AMC and then we did like a three hour training set. I was dead, man. Like we were all just dead. But after that, you know, I could run. And, you know, I went, I went, we did like the mile at high school and I like did, I, I ran it under and I did like, okay, we'll just do it this way. I'm going to run hard around the curve, dead sprint around the straights. And so I basically just sprinted most of it, you know, and, um, and I finished this thing and I could have gone hard. I, I probably could have sprinted the whole thing. And, um, and, uh, you know, the guy like, you know, I, I stopped and I said, okay. He's like, oh yeah, no, you're doing really good. Just one more lap. You know, you're having a great time. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm done. That's four. And he like, just didn't believe me. And like, he's like, wouldn't tell me my time. I'm like, dude, what is the time? That's four, man. It's like, what is the time? He ended up telling me I was, it was like four minutes and 40 seconds, but I have no idea. It was a sub five minute mile, but like, I don't know if that was like after like the 30 seconds, it took me to like get the damn time out of him. Or if that was actually when I crossed the lines, I have no idea what the hell I ran, Wow. But, you know, it was, um, Wow. It was pretty fast. <laughs> so like, especially you know, but that, that a was a guy. Thing. I mean, that's, that's a really good time for a small dude and you're a big, mm. big guy. That's, that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. But, 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 you know, you could, but you, when you, once you push yourself to that level, you're just that you're at a different level. And, you know, to, to your point before about, you know, the carbo loading, things like that, there's a, there's a you get to a whole different road, you know? And, and so, you know, when I was doing that sprinting a mile, sprinting half a mile sort of thing, that's when I was carnivore. And I just, I just couldn't get tired. You know, when, you know, a lot of, you know, endurance athletes, they'll know this, you know, you, you push yourself and you, and eventually you hit the wall, right. And you, you just, you hit the wall and you, that's it. That's all you have. And you just, you feel like crap and you either have to eat a bunch of sugar to sort of pick yourself back up uh, or you stop. Most people do, or you keep pushing like people in marathon runners know this. You keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing. And eventually you'll break through the wall and you'll get your second win. And then you have just unlimited energy. And you just go forever. You get your runner's high and all these different sort of, you know, euphemisms for what's going on. And, and you just feel great is the, is the bottom line. You can just keep going and keep going and keep going. You basically have bottomless energy after that. So what that is biochemically is that, you know, you've done your carbo loading and you filled up your glycogen and your liver and your muscles. And you will, you know, if you carbo load, you'll have three times the amount of glycogen in your liver that I will, but you'll run out of that glycogen. I keep replenishing it. I'm never going to run out of that because I'm refilling it from my fat stores. We actually have studies on this looking at uh, wolves in back in 1981 said, Oh, well, you know, you have to eat carbs to burn carbs, right? You know, well, you know, wolves don't carbo load before they chase caribou for 10 hours. So what do they do? They have blood sugar. Do they have glycogen? They found out, yes, they do. And it's rock solid. It does not change. And so no matter what they're doing, their glycogen is here. Their blood sugar is here. Their ketones are here. They are there just because they're constantly replenishing this from their fat stores. That's how that works. Mm. You know, and so when you're eating carbohydrates, you derail that. You know, like I said, you know, that you eat carbohydrates, your insulin goes up, it stops your body from being able to process your fat stores. So you can only run on your blood on your blood sugar and your liver glycogen and your muscle glycogen. So you, yeah, I mean, if you're eating carbohydrate, definitely carbo load. That's the way to go. But you know, if you don't, you know, then you'll be in a much better position because biochemically 
when you hit the wall, that's you running out of glycogen and your insulin's still up. So you can't actually mobilize any of your fat stores, which is really your main, your main energy source. Like even, you know, someone has like, you know, 10% body fat, if they don't eat for three weeks. They'll, they'll, you know, there'll be about three weeks before they even start, you know, uh, uh, catabolizing their muscle for energy, you know, like they have that much fat store in there, you know? So you're certainly not going to run out of it in a two hour workout. Like, sorry, buddy, you're not working that hard, you know? And so you run out of, um, you know, you run out of glycogen very quickly, right? So you run out of glycogen and you hit the wall because now you can't, you can't replenish it. Right. But if you keep pushing, keep pushing on, you know, normally it takes like 24 hours for your insulin to come down. You'd be able to start mobilizing your fat stores, right? But if you keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, you sort of force this into this normal, you know, ketosis or whatever you want to call it, uh, energy store uh, metabolism. So now you can actually start mobilizing this thing. You get this second win. You get this, uh, you know, uh, runner's high. Now you just feel better. The harder you work, the better you feel. And that's because you feel better when you burn energy. That's why we take stimulants. That's why we drink coffee. That's why we take, you know, uh, pre-workout stuff because, oh, we feel really good. Now we can go do our work. Whereas now the harder you work, the better you feel. Why is that? Because you're producing more energy. So you're burning more energy. So you're feeling better. So you want to work harder. So it's positive feedback, right? So I live in that second wind. I am always in a runner's high, you know? So the harder I work, the more energy I get, the better I feel. So I want to work out harder. I love going to the gym. I love doing sprints. I love going and doing the hard work because it makes me feel good. You know, some people will take pre-workout so that they can get energy, so that they can be motivated to go to the gym. I'm the opposite. I go to the gym so that I can get energy so that I can feel good. That's my, uh, you know, that's, why that's my motivation for going to the gym because like, oh, I'm, you know, I don't feel my best. I want to go feel better. I go to the gym and I'll get better. You know, when I, you know, so whatever I'm doing, I will be mobilizing the exact amount of energy that I need uh, for whatever I'm doing. So sitting here talking to you, I'm mobilizing the exact energy I need to sit here and talk to you. As soon as I go to the gym, I will require more energy. I'll produce more energy. I'll burn more energy and I'll feel better as a result. And so I'll want to work harder which will give you, you know, burn more energy, which will make me feel better, which will make me want to work harder. So I work harder and harder and harder and harder and feel better and better and better and better. And that's why I was able to push myself and push myself and push myself way past what anyone else was able to do and loved it and just kept getting better and better and better. And that's why my fitness was absolutely second to none. I, I cannot, I, I absolutely deny the fact that anyone else during that time in my life, that there was a single person in better shape than me. I don't think that there was a single person on earth. That's a very, very, maybe Matt Hume, but like he wasn't carnivore either. So like, I don't know, like if he was carnivore, then like, yeah, no, no, no question. But like, I honestly don't think, because I, I literally couldn't get tired. I mean, I was doing those, I was wind sprinting miles, you know what I mean? And, um, and then running hard after that. And I mean, I, I really remember thinking, I was just like, I could probably sprint a marathon because the amount of work that I was doing, I was working out from three o'clock in the afternoon to 10 o'clock at night. I was at a dead sprint every opportunity that I had. I couldn't get tired, you know, and, and it took a lot of work to get there. Don't get me wrong, but, you know, because I had that positive feedback and I just pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed, I was able to get there, you know, relatively quickly. And then I was able to just build on that and build on that. And so I really could not get I couldn't push myself hard enough. And so I remember thinking, I was like, I should just enter a marathon because I could probably just sprint a marathon and just like break a world record or at least win the damn thing, you know, without any problem. And like, you know, no, no, just the first marathon I ever run. I was, I, I absolutely could have done that, but it just sounded like just the most boring thing that you could ever do with your time, just running for 26 miles straight. And I was just <laughs> I know, like, right? oh, I don't want to do that. Yeah, just and so I was just like, well, if I, if, yeah, it was like, if I, if I come across a marathon, you know, because I don't, I don't know didn't know where any marathons were. It was before the internet and all that stuff, you know, or, or, you know, before it was really prevalent, you know, uh, you know, Google wasn't exi around anyway. Um, you know, that, that I was just like, well, if I, if, if something comes up and you're like, oh, there's a Seattle marathon coming or whatever, like I'll enter it, but I'm not going to go looking for it. And so I didn't really see one. So I never did it, but I remember thinking, I was like, I will regret not doing this because I definitely can sprint a marathon and like, I would like that on paper and just be like, oh yeah, I was that guy. And that's what happened. And, um, 
you know, be, because I will never be in that shape again. I, I knew that I was like, I will never be in this good of shape again, ever in my life. There's no way. And, uh, and I never will. It's just, it will never happen. <laughs> you know, I just don't have eight to 10 hours a day to just work on that. You know, it's just, that's just not going to happen. Um, but, uh, but no, but that, that's how that with, works. Uh, sorry. I was with a guy. This is perfect story for what you're, what you're referring to. Uh, we were doing wind sprints at the soccer field here where I live and, yeah. um, he's a runner runner and, uh, you know, has all the, all the toys on his wrist. And so I said, Hey, just out of curiosity, you know, with these sprints, what would these times be like in a marathon? He goes, Oh yeah, we're running. Well, if you extrapolate, we're running like four thirty miles. So yeah, we would do like the Boston marathon in like two hours and, you know, 50 minutes or something like that. I can't remember the exact numbers. And I'm like, man, I'm fast. I'm running like four minute and 30 second miles. And he's like, no, dude, you're only doing that for 50 meters. Like that's, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's you're not fast. Cause you had to stop and suck wind after 50 meters. The dudes who win the Boston marathon are doing that and even faster. And they're doing it for 26.2 miles. So they're yeah. actually running past you while you're doing your sprint. They're actually running past you and they're going to keep going for another 26 miles at that speed. Yeah. Just shocking, you know, mm. Faster than I can sprint, they're running a, a marathon. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really think, impressive. I mean, these guys are moving. They're oh, really yeah. moving. Yeah. They're waves too. That so they can just they're so light on their feet. But I'm finally starting to get this concept because now I can really see it in my mind. Where you have your three things to choose from: you have your fat, your protein, and your carb. Those are always your choices. You get your three elements. The protein's always going to be a constant because that's how you're building. So the protein's going to be a constant. That's a non-negotiable. Now the two that you're negotiating are the fat and the carbs. You can go with the carbs and break all the machinery and keep going way up and way down, which is death. You know, and then, and it's also servitude. It's slavery because you have to keep going to the fridge every 27 minutes. So it's servitude. Or you could do fat, which is what your body wanted in the first place. And you become the king instead of being the servant, because now you're the king of your body. Shoo, that hit me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's a choice. You know, it's a fundamental life yeah. choice. What are you going to choose? So that's my knife's edge right in it there. And you live on that. You live on that blade. You live on that knife's yeah. edge. And you've been doing it for 20 years, bro. 22. Yeah. So, I mean, um, not, not the whole time though, you know, so I started when I was like 20, I took cancer biology at the university of Washington in Seattle. You know, as I said, we were learning about how toxic plants were and, you know, specifically we're looking at, at carcinogens and we learned that Brussels sprouts had 136 known human carcinogens in them, just Brussels sprouts and mushrooms had over 100 spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, broccoli, you name it. Any, every, any and every plant that you've ever eaten and ever been exposed to has, has had literally over 60, 80, over hundred known human carcinogens each very abundant. We've known since the 1980s that there are 10,000 times the amount of uh, um, toxins that are just naturally existing in plants than the pesticides we spray on them. Like I, I mentioned earlier, that comes from a study from uh, Professor Bruce Ames from UC Berkeley, who showed this and they were trying to ban ALAR, which was a, a pesticide they used on apples. And they were like, like oh, we got to get rid of these things. This stuff is toxic. And he's like, well, hold on a second. We've been using this stuff for 80 years. You know, it's never caused a problem. Why would it cause a problem now? And, you know, he showed this stuff that this is that the plant is actually worse than the pesticides, right? And that there were orders of magnitude times more likely to cause cancer than the pesticides. All right. So this is why we still have pesticides. They were trying to ban them. They didn't because they're like, no, look, this is, a, this is a drop in the bucket compared to the actual plant that you're eating. So we were learning that we were blown away. And, um, I remember thinking to myself, I remember like looking around, just everyone's looking around wildly. Like this has to be a joke. Someone has to be in on the joke, looking for like a TA in the corner, like, you know, laughing or something like that. And, um, there wasn't one, there wasn't a single one. And so all of a sudden we just sort of, this is just sort of dawning on us. Like, Jesus, this guy's serious. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, you know, but, but vegetables are still good for you though. Right. And he just looked at us. He just read our minds and he just said, yeah, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. So I was like, right, screw plants. And I just stopped eating them. You know, I just went to the grocery store and I was just like, I was like, right, well, I'm not going to buy a plant. I was like, everything has plants in it. 
everything's a damn plant, you know? And, uh, and so I was just looking around like, what the hell can I eat? And I came across some eggs. I was like, okay, eggs. I mean, I guess the eggs don't come from plants. So I'll get the eggs and like milk, milk doesn't come from plants. I'll get, get some milk and then meat, meat doesn't come from plants. I'll get some meat. So that was it. I just ate egg, meat, eggs, meat, milk for like, you know, you know, five years after that. And I know, man i mean sorry to swear but like it was just i just never felt better in my entire life until right now when i'm doing it again and then sort of i was playing professionally in england in the championship league and i just sort of fell off it because some of the bread was or, or some of the meat was breaded and um it sort of didn't have the same access so i was like all right well maybe it's not that big of a deal and so i sort of slipped off of that but i was still very meat dominant until about six years ago where i went like realized like no actually humans are carnivores that's what i was doing that's why i felt so good because i was I was living as a carnivore and eating as a carnivore. And I was like, right, I knew it. I knew plants were trying to kill me, get rid of these damn plants and just start eating meat again. Just as a reminder, we're speaking with Dr. Anthony Chafee, who is a medical doctor, an MD in medical science, has conducted years of thorough research and studying and devising ways to treat ailments differently and naturally through dietary methods, physical exercise, and other lifestyle changes with scientifically supported methods. Dr. Chafee, just as a reminder to our, our folks who are listening and watching at home, how would they get in touch with you if they want to learn more about what you're doing and maybe get some video consultation? Uh, yeah, well, so I mean, a lot, a lot of my content is just on my my podcast, The Plant Free MD, which is which is available, you know, in any, any podcast platform. And then I have a YouTube channel, which is sort of my main uh, platform, uh, where I put in, you know, all my videos and everything like that. And that's just Anthony Chafee MD. And I, I show up on other people's podcasts like yourself and, and others who are kind enough to have me on. Um, and those can you know generally be found on YouTube as well. Um, mostly active as far as social media, hated, horrible social media. Um, I'm most active on Instagram. So I have an account there, just Anthony Chafee MD. For some reason, Instagram decided to cancel my plant free MD, uh, Instagram account. Uh, which is stupid. I don't know. It said that I, I violated something. Um, I don't know how or why, um, but uh, they said I did. They didn't tell me what exactly happened, but something stupid. Anyway, so I use the the Anthony Chafee MD is my main main one there, and then you know, I do some other little things on like you know Patreon or or uh, other things where I get um, more hands on with people and and can actually help people more more one-on-one -on -one and do like weekly Zoom meetings and Q and A's uh, and things like that. And then we also do, uh, for people that are actually looking to start a carnivore diet and want some help uh, with that, we, uh, my, my uh, friend of mine and I, uh, who I do some of the podcasts with Simon Lewis, he and I do a 30 day carnivore challenge where people can go in like, so, so monthly, so we're starting up another one coming up in October, then we'll do November as well. Um, and people join in, we join in a telegram group. We're all there. We're all texting each other, giving each other advice. Uh, we have like a, an online module people can go through and work through uh, some resources to teach them more about it and give them the basics and tell them exactly what to do and how to be successful at it. And then they talk to us and everyone's kept accountable and talk about how they're doing and ask questions and get advice. And then we have weekly zoom meetings as well to sort of keep people accountable, ask questions uh, about anything that's come up with them and uh and then like a facebook group as well and so we try to try to keep people supported that way and people are interested in that that's at um how to carnivore.com and um and that's that's sort of the main thing when people i do you know sometimes i do do like consultations online over zoom um when when you know time is permitting it's sort of difficult with my time uh being so heavily accounted for at the hospital and I'm doing anywhere from 90 to 130 hours a week at the hospital. And then I'm trying to do all this other stuff on the side. Uh, so it can be difficult, but I do try to make myself. And then I actually work weekends when I'm not at the hospital doing that, my functional medicine clinic as well, because they're just people that, that, you know, want help with this and they want to check their bloods and they want to have other problems that they need, uh, you know, sort of regular help with. So I do try to make myself available for that, you know, online. I, it's really more advice. I can't actually you know, fulfill a role of, a, of a, a doctor, a clinician uh, as well. And it's, it's not really possible licensing wise anyway, but if people do want advice and, and, and to help with that, I can also do um, consultations online over zoom and uh, people can sort of email um, just anthonychafee at gmail.com and they can sort of get in touch with me there. 
if they if they want to if they all the other resources. But I try to make everything available for free. You know, like all my you know my online content on YouTube and my podcast. I really I really speak my mind there. I'm not hiding anything behind a paywall. You know, everything that that I think is going to help people, I've put out there. And that's that's the whole reason I started this sort of six months ago is because I just I just, I know that it helps people. I've seen it help a lot of people. And you know, you're right. Not not a lot enough people are talking about it. So I just wanted to add my voice to it and see if that would help people. And um, so all my stuff is, 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 is none of it's behind a paywall. Um, you know, I have some stuff with Patreon and stuff like that, but that's more like just Q and A's and, and, and things where people get access to me and talk to me and things like that, that that's really it. But I still try to do live sort of sessions otherwise as well. And, uh, and then the other thing would be like the, the carnivore 30 day challenge that, that, that is a fee. That's like, I think it's like $97 us. Um, but that's, that's a joke. But that's just because that's it takes, nothing. Yeah. Well, but that's also because it's just, you know, it's time, right? It, you know, it's, it's taking, you know, my time and Simon's time. And, you know, we do, we do put a lot of time in it and we were, you know, we're in the chat groups and we're talking to people and we're spending time, you know, chatting and texting with people. And, and so, you know, we have to do that, unfortunately, just because, you know, time is, is a limited commodity, unfortunately. And so uh, we have to sort of use it wisely, but that's, that's pretty much it. But I, I always call I always tell people like, I'm happy to, to sort of help you through things. If you want to talk to me one-on-one, but, you know, sort of check out the free things first, you know, and, and hopefully that will answer all your questions. Sometimes people just really want to hear it from me, you know, like, okay, is, is do I act, you know, like I've seen your thing on cholesterol. I know, LDL, but, but is it really, I'm like, yes, hundred percent here are the studies, this and that. And they're like, okay, all right. I feel better now. They just, they want to hear it from me like face to face. And so that's, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. If I can, if I can, I can give them that reassurance, that. I'm happy to. Yeah, yeah, I can I can understand that. Well, speaking of time, I want to be sensitive with yours. So let's wrap up with uh, we touched upon the, kind of the big four diabetes, heart disease, cancer, the, the fourth and last one, um, all of the different dementias, you know, Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and, um, you know, all of the, the different uh, mental ailments. Uh, you know, they've said that really Alzheimer's is diabetes for all. The, is it really the same biomechanisms that are occurring in, in the dementias? And if so, would the carnivore protocol address that as well? Yeah. So, um, yeah, well, type, type three diabetes. Yeah. And oh, so sorry, sorry probably, type three. Yeah. 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 And so they, they're referring to it now as type three diabetes because they're like, oh, we're, we're noticing some, you know, similar, you know, you know metabolic uh, sort of uh, similarities. And uh, to me, it's, it's quite obvious that you're going to see that because they're going to have the both, both have the same cause, you know, um, there's a lot of different reasons. You have these tau proteins, these, these sort of um, uh, amyloid plaques that build up in your brain. And people thought that, oh, you build up these plaques and that disrupts uh, the function of your brain cells. And that was based on a few studies that actually very recently in the last sort of month or so, have actually been shown to have been uh, bullshit. <laughs> and so they, they sort of played up their data and they falsified their data, just like with the cholesterol, saying the cholesterol was bad for you when it really wasn't, it was never bad for you. Um, uh, they did that with, with uh, this whole uh, amyloid plaque sort of thing. And so they actually, uh, you know, uh, changed around their data, which is just, is just really upsetting when this, when this sort of stuff happens because people, you know, I mean, billions, trillions of dollars go into uh, treating these things. And, and, and people's whole lives, you know, they go down in different directions. Like we were saying before, you know, people do what they're told. Well, they're, they're trying to do the right thing. And they're saying, oh, hey, this is the best advice. Oh, we'll just do it. And, um, you know, we've certainly seen that uh, in many examples of that over the years. And, um, and this is no exception. And, you know, even, you know, back in the 80s, you know, we reduced our fat intake by 30%, reduced cholesterol by the same, reduced red meat by 33%, increased fruits and vegetables by 30 and 40% respectively, increased grains and sugar as well. And what happened? The cholesterol rate or the, sorry, the heart disease rate tripled, uh, obesity rate tripled, stroke rate tripled, cancer rates tripled, type two diabetes, autoimmune disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, even neurodevelopmental delays such as autism, these all increased exponentially. They almost didn't exist before the 1980s. Now they're the only things we treat and they all increased at the exact same time, right? So, you know, and, and, and the heart disease rate tripled, right? Cholesterol went down, heart disease went up, right? So how can you say that cholesterol causes heart disease if you reduce cholesterol and heart disease goes up? If anything, you say that cholesterol was protective. And in fact, that's what the, the, the literature is saying now. There's large 
uh, meta-analysis in 2020, actually published in uh, the Journal of the American uh, College of Cardiology, right? And, and a lot of these authors were the same authors on the previous um, uh, dietary recommendations saying, hey, so don't eat saturated fat. I, you know, this thing showed there's no correlation between saturated fat and cholesterol and uh, I'm sorry, heart disease. So it's just like, yeah, there's actually no limit on saturated fat. It's actually not a thing. And in fact, they found an inverse relationship between saturated fat and, and uh, stroke rate. So it's actually protective against stroke, you know? And so, um, and, uh, and, and cardiac death and things like that as well. So in, in fact, there were the authors on there that had previously said, stay away from saturated fat. Now they're on here saying, ooh, actually we got it wrong, sorry, you know? And so, um, so that's the thing. And um, it's, uh, that, that's where we're actually seeing now and higher LDL cholesterol is actually better for you. You're having less heart attacks, less strokes, less cardiac death, you're living longer, staying out of nursing homes, uh, living independently longer, just with, with higher LDL cholesterol. And there's more that goes into it than that. Obviously you have a different lifestyle. You're probably eating more meat, more fat, and, uh, and not listening to, uh, the, uh, people that are telling you to do the opposite. And so that's going to help you as well, but that's just sort of a correlation as well. But, you know, to your question about Alzheimer's in particular, I mean, this is something that we've seen, you know, especially increased at the same time, again, because people go on, on a, uh, you know, low fat heart, healthy, supposedly diet. And, you know, now everyone's getting, first of all, more heart attacks, but they're also getting dementia and they're going to nursing homes. And this is not something that was, was actually very, very normal. Uh, elderly did not go into nursing. People, oh, well, people weren't living that long. No, they actually were. That's, that's really uh, ignorant. <laughs> you actually just look at the statistics and the, um, you know, people were absolutely living that age. And, um, you know, just people were dying in infancy more often, like in the 1800s. So you had the average life expectancy from birth was younger. But, uh, what, but people, if you made it to adulthood, you know, routinely lived in their 80s, 90s, over 100. That's actually a very normal thing. And, uh, and actually genetically, we're designed to live 120 years. So actually dying in your 80s is very premature. You know, that means you've been doing really bad things to yourself. You know, like you've been eating a lot of spinach and that's not good. And, uh, you know, so it's actually quite normal to live, live to these ages. And people were living to these ages and not getting dementia. They were not going to nursing homes. Sim simple way of looking at that. How many nursing homes were there in the 1950s? Not many, you know? And so as a percentage of the population, right? So, you know, yes, there are more old people now, but there are also a higher percentage of old people going to nursing homes and requiring nursing homes and having, you know, end stage dementia. So looking at, at diabetes as a metabolic disease, you know, with, with people like uh, Professor Ben Bickman from BYU have shown, he's been studying, you know, insulin and the metabolism for you know, over 15 years now. Um, you know, he actually shows that, you know, type two diabetes is insulin, peripheral insulin resistance. You're getting resistance, uh, you know, tissue so that, so insulin is not working as well. You're not getting the glucose. You're not getting the energy into your tissues as well. So you're not getting energy in your brain is one of these tissues, right? So now you're not getting energy into your brain. You're not being able to run your brain properly. So it's not going to work properly. It's not going to you know run as well. So you're not going to, you know, be able to think as well. And it's also not going to be able to rebuild itself. It's not going to be able to maintain itself. It doesn't have the energy to do that. Also, if you're going on low fat diets, low saturated fat diets, low cholesterol diets. Your brain is made out of saturated fat and cholesterol and it's specifically animal fats, very long chain fatty acids, 20 and 22 chain fatty acids. You know, those don't exist in plants and we don't really make them well ourselves. We have to get them from animal fat. And if we don't, our brains don't have the substrate to build and maintain our brains and they will degrade. They will degrade. And if you look at MRIs and CTs of our brain, as we age, they will atrophy. They'll just shrink and get smaller. And that's all oh, that's normal, normal atrophy of, uh, of, of age related changes. No, should, your brain should not be rotting and withering away. Like that's not normal, but we, it's normal in the sense that it's common, but it's not normal in the sense that it should be happening. That, that, is, that, is, that is a typical process in a healthy individual. All right. So no, that should not be happening. Maybe some, but not, not to the extent that we're getting now. Now, specifically with Alzheimer's, you know, now you're getting that, that peripheral insulin resistance in your brain. So now even less and less energy you're getting in and your brain's just shutting down and shutting down and shutting down. Um, you know, people that get low blood sugar, their brains get all screwy and they're like, oh, they, and they, they start, you know, acting goofy and, and all that sort of stuff, you know, and be like, oh, okay, their brain's not getting energy. Okay. You switch them over to ketones. They wake right up, right like that, because ketones don't need insulin 
to get into your brain. They just go, they just cross the blood brain barrier freely and they just get in there and your brain just wakes up. And again, you know, your brain primarily runs on ketones. First of all, your brain always runs on ketones, no matter what biochemical state you are in. And it's only when you have very low ketones and an abundance of, of glucose that your brain will switch over to, to, to glucose, but whatever ketones are there, it's taking in. And at a certain point when the ketones go up to a certain point, doesn't matter how much keto, um, you know, you know, glucose you have, as soon as you get enough, a high enough threshold of ketones to exclusively run on ketones, bam, it will only run on ketones. And so when you do that in someone with Alzheimer's, their brain will wake up like that. Now they still have atrophy. They still have damage to their brain because they've had, you know, decades of damage and degradation from not feeding it what it's supposed to be fed, but it will still all of a sudden then get the energy to run however well it can run at that point with that degradation, it will run that well, which is a lot better than it would otherwise with that depleted energy source. So you'll see in a day or two, they're a different person, you know? And so we're, we're, and you see this in practice. In fact, there was a study that looked at a ketogenic diet. And there are, there are thousands of studies now showing the efficacy of a ketogenic diet. I mean, just tons and tons and tons. And people say, oh, well, you know, like fasting is really good. And so we now have fasting mimicking diets. Okay, there's a fasting mimicking diet, which is a ketogenic diet, right? Because you're mimicking the, the metabolic state. In fact, fasting puts you in the metabolic state that you're supposed to be in anyway. So fasting mimics how you're supposed to be all the time anyway. That's the benefit of fasting is that you're getting into the metabolism you're supposed to be in, which you could be in all the time if you ate properly. And so we have thousands of studies showing that a ketogenic diet, just ketogenic, I mean, not, not even getting rid of all the other plant toxins has huge benefits. And one of them was in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. They found that, that people that went on a ketogenic diet as a, as a treatment regime for, that had Alzheimer's had, had better treatment, had better efficacy of, um, from the ketogenic diet than every medication ever trialed for Alzheimer's ever. Wow. Okay. So it's better than any pharmaceutical. Okay. How much money is there in saying don't eat bread? None. Right. But there's billions in this drug. Oh, this helps people with Alzheimer's. Oh, thank God you miracle worker. How good, like, how good are you? You know, like, you know, so they're, they're going to pay whatever they have to, because they, you know, they want to get that out there. And that's, and that's, so that has a lot of money behind it and that can push that out. Whereas it, it takes no money at all to say, Hey, just don't eat, don't, don't eat carbs, you know? And, uh, and we, and we have this going back you know, hundred years with, with epilepsy, you know, seizures and migraines, you know, like epilepsy doesn't actually need to be a major thing. Like there most causes of epilepsy get just taken away if you just stop eating carbs, full stop. You know, it just changes your energy, the energy processing in your brain. And it just, that's it. You just stop having seizures. And we've forgotten this because we went to this problem pill. Here's a problem. Here's a pill uh, sort of modality. And now, you know, you know I was talking about um, Professor Thomas Seafried, uh, Boston College, you know, the cancer bi you know, biology professor and you know, cancer biology uh, expert has 150 pub uh, peer reviewed publications in, in cancer biology and other things. Well, he, when he was at Yale, um, he was, a, I think he's like an associate professor at Yale um, after his postdoc. He, he was doing research in keto, you know, ketogenic diet and epilepsy. And he was like told by, you know, by the different sort of, you know, um, you know, uh, head of like neurology there, neurosciences, like, yeah, there's, there's nothing in that, you know, don't worry about that. You know, everything's about, you know, the pharmaceuticals. Now these pharmaceuticals work so well, we don't need to worry about diet anymore. Like, why wouldn't that be your first protocol? You know, you can stop the majority of seizures just by changing someone's diet and, and you, and you benefit their life by a thousand other different ways. And, you know, I mean, think about this for two seconds, you know, this changes your body and makes sure you don't have seizures anymore. Couldn't there possibly be other added benefits? Maybe this is like where you're supposed to be anyway. You know, maybe this is supposed to be, maybe this is something that's causing a significant amount of harm and can actually precipitate seizures. So maybe we don't want this in our body anyway. You know, maybe the people that are susceptible get seizures, but like, it's not going to be good for any of us, you know? And so, you know, but he was, he was sort of put off that research because there's this, this, you know, pharmaceutically driven um, mentality of like, you just have to have a pill for it. That's the only thing that works because you can sell pills, you know? And so as Seafried says, 
you know, it's like when we, when someone figures out, when some entrepreneur figures out a way of, of making um, a medical system profitable by just giving good advice, you know, then this will take off, you know, and, and hopefully right. that happens. But, um, you know, I think like, you know, Dr. Baker with Rivera Health, like he's actually starting to do that because he's going, he's, he's taking Rivera Health and going to large companies and saying, hey, I can, I can decrease your costs and paying your medical insurance by, you know, X amount of tens of millions of dollars a year. If you follow these protocols, if you guys do these things, you will pay less in your insurance. That makes money, and people listen to that. And I think that's I think that's a good angle, and hopefully that goes that way. Um, I also read a study recently that someone who's doing research showing that it's probably autoimmune driven these these amyloid plaques in um, in Alzheimer's. And so again, um, this is going to be addressed by a carnivore diet um, specifically, and this 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 is, speaks to why this works so well because. You know, autoimmune issues. I have yet to see an autoimmune issue not uh, be significantly improved by going on a carnivore diet. There's a lot of reasons for that, but you know, one of the one of the mechanisms of autoimmunity now is um, from a cross reaction called molecular mimicry, where you eat some of these plant toxins, they get in your system, and your body says that's foreign. We don't want that, and it attacks it with antibodies. And some of those antibodies are close enough to something in your body that it starts attacking that. And so you get this cross reaction and that may or may not be the mechanism that's, that's sort of going into these amyloid sort of plaques, but that is the sort of the mechanism in a lot of other autoimmune issues. And so when you remove the plants, you remove those toxins and your body stops making antibodies towards those toxins. And then you stop having these toxins in your system or these antibodies in your system that then spill over and attack part of your body. And so, you know, I think that um, that uh, that's very very possible that that could be you know something else is driving that sort of plaque you know deposition as well. But either way, you know we don't see you know we don't see these sorts of um, you know brains degrading and 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 chronic disease. We don't see cancer in the wild. We don't see you know, Eskimos, they don't, you know, and Inuits, they're not getting, you know, Alzheimer's, they're not getting Parkinson's, they're not getting cancer, you know, like, you know, zebras don't get cancer, wild animals don't get cancer, animals in the zoo, when being fed their natural diet, don't get cancer. Dogs and cats get cancer, and they're getting more and more cancer, more and more and more cancer. That's because they're getting, you talk to vets, they say, you know, animals are now getting more human diseases. And some people say, well, that's because they're, you're, you're intensively breeding these things. Um, idiot. They're called pure breeds for a reason. They were already a pure breed long before, you know, the diseases started going up and long before the, 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 their life expectancy went down, you know, the life expectancy of a golden retriever pure breed in the 1970s in America was 17 years on average. Now it's nine years, still a pure breed, still a golden retriever. Is it a different, is it a different, different dog? Are we dealing with different genetic populations here? Probably not. You know, you don't, you don't change that dramatically, you know, literally half the lifespan, like that's it, you know? No, it's because, you know, we're feeding a bunch of grain and plant-based bullshit in these, in these uh, easy, you know, ready-made uh, packaged dog food. And, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I was just like scooping this crap out for my dog. And I was just like, dogs are wolves, wolves are carnivores. You should just be eating meat. You know, I was like, what, what is this, this crap? And I was just like, well, you know, it's dog food. That's what dogs are supposed to eat. I guess, I guess they know. And unfortunately I was a victim of that appealing to authority. You know, I was like, well, I guess they're the authority there. They should know. No, they don't know. They don't give a crap about my dog. They didn't, you know, want my dog to live as long as possible. They wanted to, to get as much money out of, out of me. Um, and then I'll get a new dog or whatever, if it dies young. Um, so they're just using cheap bullshit to push a product. That's what they wanted to do. And so our dogs and our cats are getting cancer. Dogs and cats are known carnivores, right? And we give them grain and plant-based kibble. And they're getting the same illnesses that we are. They're getting cancer. They're getting diabetes. They're getting heart disease. They're getting uh, you know, autoimmune issues. You know, They're getting arthritis, hip dysplasia, all these sorts of things. These are things that we get if we're eating things, a uh, species inappropriate diet, if we're eating outside of our species. And, you know, uh, you know, any zookeeper will tell you the same thing happens to zoo animals. That if you feed them something that they don't eat in the wild, something they didn't evolve on, they get sick. What do they get sick with? 
obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, autoimmune issues, arthritis, all the same things, you know? And so they don't get that when they don't eat outside of their species. And, and Alzheimer's is, is, is uh, you know, not unique to that. Well, you are an absolute uh, force of nature, my friend. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm sitting here you know, this is close to 1 a.m. for you in Perth, Australia. Your your living example, living proof of the energy principle, at the very least, of what you're talking about, that steady energy, yeah. just to be able to rattle off this kind of information in such a fluid way, in such a steady way, without any dip in, again, energy, um, and just the generosity, you know, you had spent something, you'd said something earlier about, you know, the, the thrill of it is in the healing the people. That's, that's where you really, you know, that you can get your hands on, like you're talking as a surgeon, the hands-on aspect, the healing aspect. And now you're able to do that with this information. And I can tell that's what lights you up. And the proof of it is, is that you're actually in a way working against your best financial interests. Um, <laughs> you know, that's the irony in this. It, like you're saying there's not as much money in information dissemination as there is in hospitalization. Mm. And so that bears out that you really are trying to get people well, like your intentions here are trying to help people. You're trying to heal people. You're trying to get this much needed information in front of as many people as possible. And, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to do my small part in this and thrilled to be able to, to get this information out. I'm sure there was a ton of questions I should have asked. Um, is there anything key that I, that I left out that I didn't touch upon? And I would also like to ask you if we can reconvene in the future for a follow-up. Yeah, a hundred percent. No, I'd love to. Um, no, I, I think you know, we covered everything. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, I, I think there's a hundred different tangents on everything we could have spoken about as we could have gone on, you know, in, in any different direction, um, you know, ad nauseum. But I think the only thing that, that I would add is, you know, just to, to, to build on that last thing that you said is like, yeah, you know, we get a, as doctors, we get a lot more money uh, when people are sick and we get a lot more money for doing procedures and for doing surgeries. You know, we get a lot of money to do surgeries because they're super technical, they're super difficult. There aren't many people in the world that can do them and we carry high stakes. I mean, we pay, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, insurance, uh, malpractice insurance that, that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, I was, I was talking to a neurosurgeon the other day and he was saying that his, they were, his insurance company was trying to charge him $450,000 a year just in his malpractice, right? So that's, that's you know, if you just had that as income, right? you'd be in like, you know, the top 5% of income earners in America. You know, if you just, if you just made what this guy just has an to insurance pay. Payment. And, and yeah, exactly. And so, you know, it's, um, it's uh, you know, obviously, you know, the cost of doing business is, is high um, because the stakes are very high, but you know, you, you, you do get compensated for that. And, but you, you really get compensated for that for, from doing the surgeries. That's really what it comes down to. And, you know, and so doing like a you know, big surgery, big craniotomy, you know, taking out some massive tumor, spending, you know, five hours carefully dissecting this thing out. Um, you know, that, 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 that's hugely satisfying. It's an amazing work. And I absolutely love it. I would happily never do one again and never be paid for it again. If that meant that people didn't have the problem in the first place. And, um, and I would, I would love that. I would love that. I would love to make medicine back what it was before all this chronic disease uh, came and exploded out of nowhere. I would really, really love to put a lot of doctors out of work or at least put them into different lines, areas of work. So they're not just treating just chronic disease and things that we don't need to treat. They just go away. You know, if you have lead poisoning, you don't treat the lead poisoning by anything else, but I say you eliminate, you take out the lead pipes. You know, oh, here's this pill and it'll, it'll mitigate that. No, don't worry. You can keep drinking leaded water. Well, that's fine. No, get rid of the damn leaded water. And then you don't have the lead poisoning. Okay. And so the problem is now is that we're, we're looking at the wrong way. And I, I really want doctors to wake up to that and to, and to really just go back to what medicine was really about and actually helping people and healing them when they're sick. Right now we're, we're in the, in the, in the business of disease modification and, um, 
you know, disease mitigation. We're trying to, we're trying to sort of have you help you live with a disease and live with, you know, being poisoned all your life and instead of getting rid of the damn thing. You know, that, that's not what it used to be. We used to be able, you basically, it was a kill or cure. You basically survived it or you died um, or, you know, you had, um, you know, some sort of major injury and you were able to heal from it or whatever. Um, but you know, we never had this thing where you just, you were just slowly rotting away. You know, what does that sound like? That sounds like someone's, you know, someone's wife is, you know, trying is, is not, you know, has a, has a prenup and doesn't want to like, you know, go through the divorce courts and it's, it's just like, you got to die, you know? And so they're going to like poison you slowly, you know, over years. And um, you know, that's what that sounds like. And that, and that is what it turns out to be. We're being poisoned. Slow poison is still poison. And so I really, really, really want to make medicine. I have a lot less for doctors to do in the future. And I want us to be able to uh, you know, actually be able to treat and cure problems and get rid of these things like we used to. And, um, and that means, you know, we're going to be doing less procedures. Good. I want there to be less procedures. I want people to have less cancers. I want them to need less surgeries. Um, that would, that would make me really happy. If I was, if I was able to do that, if I was able to affect that change in the world, or at least play a small role in that. I think that that would be, you know, a life well lived. I think that's something that would be, um, just amazing. I think that would just be, you know, a fantastic thing to do for the world. And I hopefully one day can achieve that. Thank you so much, doctor. Um, one more time. He is Dr. Anthony Chafee, uh, clearly one of the world's leading experts in carnivore and the carnivore nutritional protocol, plant-free MD. If you want to listen to some fantastic podcasts and all his material is free, as he was saying, it's not behind paywalls. And it is a laughable number that it costs if you want to do the carnivore month with him for all of that coaching and all that counsel and all of that intel that he's developed over the years for $97. It's, it's laughable. It should be in the thousands. Well, thank you, doctor, <laughs> so much. And thank you again for coming on in the future because I have a feeling this show is going to light it up and people are going to want to hear more. Absolutely, man. Happy to come on anytime. It was a pleasure. Thank you, brother. Talk soon. Thanks, Doc. For our full schedule of fights on the NBC Sports Network, CW, and ABC affiliates, visit unitedfightalliance.com. United Fight Alliance. United, we fight.